in our formative years, many of us, entranced by the excitement of our first experiences of love, fantasise about a reality where our love is not unrequited. Oftentimes, however, reality delivers a harsh wake-up call. Your fantasy was just that. Your love goes unrequited. No matter how perfect you believe you are for your prospective partner, they do not agree. When this happens, we should learn from it, we should grow. Doing so means you enter into adulthood as a more rounded, kinder and ultimately more desirable person. But in the tragic case of Hayley Anderson, we see what happens when someone doesn't or refuses to learn these important rites of passage. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Hayley Anderson was born on May the 9th, 1995 in Westbury, Long Island, New York. She was the elder sister of Madeline Anderson and daughter to parents Karen and Gordon. By 2018, Hayley was a fifth year student at Binghamton University. There, she also worked at the Jasmine's Coffee Shop located on campus. She was due to receive her degree in May of 2018. She already had a job secured at an emergency room in Long Island. According to her friends, Hayley was a dedicated worker who was also kind, pleasant and sensitive. Hayley also had a passion for music. On Thursday, March the 8th, 2018, Hayley was now 22 years old. She stayed up late with her housemates with whom she played board games and drank alcohol. They were now all in their last year of school. They were looking forward to graduating and to experience the real world that awaited them. The friends finished up just a few minutes before 4 in the morning and then went to bed. Josie Artin, who was Haley's roommate, woke up just a few hours later. She went to check on Haley in her bed, but Haley wasn't there. However, due to the fact that the friends were now all independent, all adults, this did not really raise any concerns. Nobody really saw or heard from her the entire day. There were several attempts to contact her by phone, and she didn't return those calls, which they thought was peculiar, but it really didn't seem to be an issue we weren't super worried at that point because, you know, Haley's a big girl. We don't need to keep tabs on her. Later on the same night, though, she started to get worried. Haley was scheduled to meet Josie and other friends at a bar. Haley was dependable, and if she said she would meet you somewhere, she did. However, on this occasion, she did not show up. Josie also noticed that Haley hadn't published anything on her social media sites at any point that day. When she tried to call her, no one answered. All of the friend's text messages remained unread. However, using the application Find My Friends, Josie and one of Haley's other roommates were able to track down Haley's iPhone. It was shown to be at a property in Oak Street. This property was owned by Orlando Tessero, age 20. Orlando was also enrolled in the nursing school. He and Haley had dated on and off for a little more than a year whilst they were both students. Although Orlando was born in Miami, he spent his childhood in Nicaragua and later moved back to the United States to pursue his education. He was a smart student who studied throughout the week but when he had free time, he enjoyed going out with his friends and having fun. Pretty standard student stuff. Meshayla Tapali, Josie's other roommate, and Josie proceeded to Oak Street to check on whether Haley was there or not. However, the girls weren't to know what had happened there just a few hours before. Earlier that day, the Oak Street property was the subject of a call to the police. They were asked to do a well-being check on Orlando because his sister had received a troubling text message from him and wanted to make sure that he was okay. At this time, the police tried to contact Orlando, but no one answered the door or their phone. It didn't appear like anyone was present when they arrived. When Josie and Michelle arrived, it did not appear that anything at the property was out of the norm. However, when they knocked at the door, just as the police did, there was no answer. It still appeared like there was nobody there, but something in their gut told them not to give up on their friend. 
They located a window that was open and the two friends climbed in. They walked through Orlando's home looking for any trace of Haley's phone. Instead, as they entered Orlando's bedroom, half hidden beneath the blankets of his bed, they discovered Haley. An almost unbelievable situation to find themselves in, the girls could not determine whether Haley was still alive. I didn't know for sure that she was dead at the time. She just was so pale, you know. They placed a call to 911. A few minutes later, after arriving at the home, the police and emergency services personnel determined that Haley had indeed passed away, passed as a result of compression to the neck. After searching the property, it was clear that Orlando was no longer there. But was this the result of a kidnapping, or had he fled on his own accord, for other reasons? Police investigations quickly revealed that Haley and Orlando had a romantic connection on and off, but it was Haley that ultimately decided to discontinue the relationship. Orlando wanted a more serious and committed relationship, but Haley was not interested in anything as serious as that at that time. She did, however, intend for them to continue their friendship, but Orlando was not happy with that prospect. The news of Haley's passing quickly spread in her community. She was just such a bubbly person, open up to anyone. She was literally like the greatest person ever. She never like didn't have a smile on her face. She did an internship at a hospital here on Long Island and she told me about all the operations that, that she witnessed. Tragic loss. I realized it was her. It's just the bottom fell out, really. Very upsetting. She was always the one who was the most sensitive and supportive friend ever. One co-worker said, She was a very good girl. She was friendly, joked around. We had a good time together. Everybody is sad. A lot of students came to New York together and they cried today. They were all so close, she said in tears. Six months earlier, at a gathering that took place on September the 15th, 2017, Haley and Orlando both attended. Orlando was observed shouting at Haley after she rekindled her relationship with former lover Kevin Acampo. This apparently made him very upset. Orlando believed that Haley should have no other romantic interests but him. However, Haley reiterated to him that she did not want the same things as him, but that she did still desire to continue their friendship. After the party, Haley and Kevin spent the night together at her apartment. When Kevin awoke the next morning, he discovered that the tires on Haley's car had been slashed. Haley went to the police to report the incident, citing Orlando as a suspect, but Orlando denied having anything to do with it. However, everyone knew that he was guilty. Because the damage was greater than $600, criminal charges would have to be brought against him. Haley, being kind, didn't want Orlando to get a criminal record and lose his spot at college. So, she decided to drop the charges in exchange for payments for the tyres. Now that Haley had passed, the police looked deeper into Orlando. Those close to Haley told the police that Orlando appeared to be obsessed. He would drop by her apartment unannounced and sometimes drive by as well. He did his best to never let her out of his sight. However, Haley's kindness prevailed. She didn't want to be cruel and she still kept in touch with him. She didn't want him to feel as though he was being socially excluded. Police now gained a better understanding of what happened on Haley's final night. How exactly did Haley find herself in Orlando's home when she was believed to be safe in her own bed? Police were aware that there were a lot of security cameras located in the neighbourhood, as well as outside of Orlando's house. They reviewed the footage and discovered that Haley and Orlando entered his house together. At this time, Haley appeared to be okay. She was up and walking. She entered the home seemingly of her own free will. After a few hours had passed, the tape showed that Orlando had left the house alone. After that, he proceeded to a nearby drugstore where he bought two kinds of sleep aid medication, NyQuil and melatonin. He then headed back to his house. The surveillance footage showed that he exited the property once more, seven hours later, and he then proceeded to walk down to the basement of the property. The investigation led the police to suspect that Orlando made an attempt on his own life in the basement at this time. They discovered a rope as well as several hooks. 
However, they were under the impression that he failed, and he had instead fallen and wounded himself. They also discovered what they assumed to be a message left by Orlando, which was written in Spanish. The English translation read, I'm really sorry about this. I never felt I could be capable of doing this. Father, I'll see you soon. Disturbingly, Orlando's father passed some five years earlier. Police believe the letter was not only a farewell note, but also a confession. The surveillance footage showed Orlando leaving the residence with luggage later that day. Police then traced his path to the JFK International Airport. There, he embarked on a flight to Nicaragua. It was discovered that Orlando held two citizenships, one of which was American, the other in Nicaragua where his mother still lived. Due to the fact that he held this dual citizenship, the authorities in Nicaragua were not obligated to extradite him to the United States. In spite of this, US authorities charged him with murder in the second degree. They did this in the expectation that he would be extradited to the United States so that he may stand trial there, in the country where he committed this dastardly crime. The task of locating Orlando now fell on the shoulders of Nicaraguan authorities. And only five days since Haley's passing, Orlando was tracked down to a hospital in the city of Leon. When Orlando Tercero was picked up by police in Nicaragua, they found a Nicaraguan passport on him. Now, while the Binghamton DA works on getting him extradited back to the U.S., we understand that it could take months to do so because he is a citizen of both countries. We're live in Westbury, Long Island. Magdalena Jaris, CBS 2 News. He had attempted once more to take his own life, which resulted in him sustaining injuries that required medical attention. It took the authorities in Nicaragua well over a year before they were satisfied that they had sufficient evidence to prosecute Orlando and send him to trial. This process was slow due to the fact that there was a lot of back and forth between authorities in the United States and Nicaragua. US authorities were surprised and dismayed to learn that Orlando would not be extradited, but that the trial would take place in Nicaragua, and that the allegations would be different from those with which he was initially due to be charged with in the US. He was accused of femicide, which is a special type of hate crime in Nicaragua. It involves a premeditated attack on a woman who was involved in a romantic connection with the accused. After hearing the arguments of both the prosecution and defence, the judge would then reach a decision. There would be no jury in this case. Justice fell on the shoulders of this one decision maker. The prosecution said that Haley willingly entered the residence with Orlando, and that he later attacked her and she passed shortly after their arrival. They had the suspicion that this happened whilst she was sleeping. Their argument was that he was hopelessly in love with her and that no one else could have her if he couldn't. They felt that he attacked her in a fit of jealous rage after she once more turned down the opportunity to be in a dedicated relationship with him. They believed that this rage had been growing since the incident with Kevin and slashing the tyres six months earlier. Video calls allowed the court to hear testimony from witnesses located back in the States. Some of Haley's friends testified about Orlando's obsessive side when it came to Haley. They described how he drove by and called the apartment, as well as how he slashed the tyres on Haley's car. The CCTV footage from outside Orlando's home proved that he entered the home with Haley, but did not take her with him when he left. The court was also informed about Orlando's actions in the basement and the letter he wrote to his deceased dad. According to the testimony of pathologist Dr. James Terzian, Haley passed due to compression of the neck. The prosecution said this was all because Haley wouldn't go out with Orlando. It was the defense's argument that Orlando had absolutely no recall of what took place earlier that evening. They contended that Orlando's consumption of alcohol at the time of Haley's passing caused him to suffer a momentary lapse into insanity. They only brought one witness, a psychiatrist, to testify to his mental condition. They could find no one else to speak in his defence. After taking a break for 90 minutes, the judge came back to announce the decision. The judge, Fabiola Betancourt, informed the court that she had reached a verdict that Orlando was guilty. She said that she believed that Orlando just could not accept that Haley could make her own decisions and choose who she wanted to date. 
She gave the most severe possible penalty for the crime of femicide, which was 30 years in jail. Back in America, District Attorney Stephen Cornwell of Broom County, who was keeping a close eye on the proceedings, offered the following statement. The United States authorities were pleased with how everything was handled. It was a serious trial and not a show trial. In response to his conviction, Orlando filed an appeal. In Nicaragua, there were three magistrates who participated in the hearing of the appeal. The defence presented the same position as before. They also argued that Orlando was charged with murder in the second degree in the United States, and if he had been found guilty of that crime, he would have received a sentence that was less than 30 years. Consequently, they believed that the sentence should be reconsidered. Karen and Gordon Anderson, Haley's parents, expressed their gratitude to the court for their efforts when it was announced that the appeal would be refused. Mother Karen said, Thank you very much for not granting the appeal. But I think that justice has been served to the best that it could have been. Um, and if anything could come from Haley's death, it is the awareness of the consequence that can be had. I have not seen any remorse from him. I've only seen regret that he is not going to be able to lessen his sentence. Unfortunately, I don't even think 30 years is enough. Father Gordon believes that justice has been served and also thank the court. Do you think this was the right punishment for Orlando? We all have those friends that, for some reason, we would never fully trust. You may have known them for most of your life, maybe since school. Growing together, building bonds in your formative years, and as time passes, experiencing the trials and tribulations of growing up into the adult world. But what if that friend, one day, turned on you in the most despicable and vile way possible? This is the true story of Keeley Bunker. Keeley Bunker was born on September the 7th, 1999. On Wednesday the 18th of September in 2019, Keeley was now 20 years old. This was a date that she had been long excited for. She had tickets to see musician H perform at the O2. Just a few days earlier, she tweeted, Only thing keeping me going is seeing H on Wednesday. Hopefully he'll see me and we'll get married. Keely had just turned 20 a few days before on the 7th, and in honour of the occasion, she was eager to celebrate. That evening, she attended the show with her friend Monique Riggan. The two were good friends, they spent a lot of time together, and they lived nearby to each other in Tamworth, a town located in Staffordshire, England, in the UK. The gig was everything the two friends hoped it would be, minus a proposal of marriage. After the show, they headed to Snobs Nightclub in Birmingham to catch up with some of their friends and to hang out for a while. The two had fun, they had some drinks and did some dancing. And then, when it was time to go home, Keeley, Monique and one of their mutual friends, Wesley Street, all rode together in the same taxi on their way back to Tamworth. All three of them lived in just about the same area, so they all disembarked the taxi at Monique's house. When they arrived, it was almost four o'clock in the morning. Monique asked Keeley if she would like to stay the night. Although nearby, Keeley's house was still a 20-minute walk. She had an interview later that day for a teaching assistant job that she really wanted to get. So, before the interview took place, she wanted to catch up on a little bit of sleep in her own bed. She told Monique, I've got Wes. Wes lives near me. Wes will walk me back. It will be fine. Because Keely and Wesley had known each other since school, they knew each other well and were trusted friends. Additionally, Wesley did live nearby to Keely, so this plan seemed to make sense. Monique begged Wesley to look out for Keeley, and he told her that he would make sure that Keeley arrived home in one piece. The time of Keeley's job interview arrived. However, Keeley didn't. Her friends and family tried to contact her by phone, but there was no response. At 5.30pm on the 19th of September, Keeley's father, Christopher, filed a missing persons report for his daughter. 
being as Wesley was the last person that was known to have seen Keeley alive, he was questioned by the police. He explained to them that they had walked together for a portion of the way home, but that they had parted ways when they reached a telephone box close to his residence. That, according to Wesley, was the final time he came into contact with Keeley. Wesley was very drunk. He is said to have consumed three times as much alcohol as his female friends. The police invited him to go in the police car with them so they could pinpoint a precise spot where he and Keeley parted ways. He pointed out the phone box just as he described, but when they made a request to look at his phone, he refused to hand it over. Okay. Going down. Which way would you go home normally? Uh, this way. That, shop, back so that way? Yeah? yeah. Shop, okay. Yeah. Is that the way you would walk? If, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just as part of the investigation, mate, I actually need to grab your phone off you. Yeah, Is that all right? Yeah, right just grab it, mate. Yeah, that's fine. Right I, I, I don't... Yeah. What, I don't... Cause well, now, when you say you take, you're going to take my phone, now I feel like you're blaming me. No, we haven't... We haven't... Mate, we, we, haven't we haven't... We haven't... We haven't once since we've been sat in this car, I think, I think your dad can vouch, yeah. we haven't once blamed you for anything. All we've done, we've been told by our bosses yeah. that we need to... Take take us on the, no, no, to take on the scene, yeah. uh, to the, you know, where it's gone, the route. Whilst Wesley was demonstrating to the authorities the route that he and Keeley took to go home, Keeley's relatives and friends were out hunting for her all throughout Tamworth. As they searched, a distressing cry was heard. It came from a member of the search party just a few hours after Keeley was reported missing. The scream came from Keeley's uncle, Jason Brown. Another member of the search party gave the following description of the scream. It was the most horrendous scream or shout I've ever heard in my life. Uncle Jason had found a body. It was half immersed in a pond in Wigington Park in Tamworth. Her underwear and clothing was pulled down to her ankles. She had been unconsensually assaulted before she passed. The autopsy revealed that she passed by compression to the neck. The body was confirmed to be that of 20-year-old Keeley Bunker. Right. Wesley, yeah. you need to listen to me. Hi. It's a moment of time. You're under arrest. You have suspicion of murder. Okay, you don't have to say anything. You may harm your defence if you do. I mention my question. It's a in court. Anything you do say may be given evidence, okay? Wesley Street was taken into custody and charged with murder. It is. It's scary, but not scary in a way. The sergeant, when you get there, the sergeant will explain everything. Yeah. So oh. you, and you got any questions, you'll answer, oh, because oh. basically there's a custody sergeant here that looks after everyone, you're, yeah. yeah, so you're, you know, go through your welfare, your legal rights, yeah. um, and if there's anything that you want, do you, I'm sure. Yeah, well, that's natural, mate. Well, no, 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 cold. Cold. yeah, okay. yeah. there's yeah. sort of blanket and stuff like that, oh. it, it'll all, any, you know, you just, basically, there's people that work here to make sure that people are coming Just, here. just how, how, yeah, I know what you mean, whatever he says, just... Yeah, that's it, yeah. Have you had any alcohol or drugs in the last 24 hours? Uh, yes, I've had alcohol. What did you have and when did you have that? Uh, probably got to from around about 11-ish, somewhere near that time. And I was drinking vodka. 11 o'clock last night? Yeah, yeah, it was a nice job. Yeah. You said, when I've asked you if you're going to harm yourself, I'm I'm harm said, no. Virgin, yeah. How are you feeling now? I don't know. Have you had any alcohol or drugs? But answered yes to me. I did vodka and red bull last night. You're not dependent on alcohol or drugs. You're not allergic to anything. And you haven't got any dietary needs or religious, religious needs. And there's nothing else that I need to know about that might affect you while you're here. Would you say that's accurate? Uh, can we change it? Which one? Uh, where it says it's dinner. Like I say, it's yeah. a bit sad. A bit sad, okay. Yeah. That's I'm not a problem. I wouldn't even say a bit sad. It's just like sad. Sad. Okay. Can change that for you? That's your name if you would, which is sign your name between those two yellow lines there. Yeah. Say, you yeah. answered those questions yeah. correct. Keeley's mother said, Keely was the kindest, most caring, innocent young lady you could ever meet and was only just starting out in her life. Such is the hell we feel we are incapable of showing any forgiveness. Keely's best friend of 16 years, Gabriel Summerfield, said, I'm so sorry that I couldn't protect you. I can't come to terms that my best friend has been taken away. She was stunning, she had a heart of pure gold and no one could ever come close. You were my only best friend I've ever had. You had so much more to give. You were beautiful, smart, and an amazing friend. 
You will always be with me. I love you so, so much, Keely. I miss you so much. In the days leading up to Street's trial, he denied any involvement in the incident and provided four distinctly different versions of what took place that evening. When the trial began, Wesley made another alteration to his account. He maintained that he was innocent of the allegation of murder, but claimed that he had unintentionally murdered her when they were having consensual intercourse in the park. He continued to assert that he was innocent. He agreed that he had lied about what had occurred, but he claimed that the only reason he had done so was because he was scared and embarrassed. Wesley said that the two of them started flirting with one another when they were walking home together that night. According to Street, Keeley started teasing him. According to him, it wasn't a touchy type of flirt or anything. It was just looking at each other in a flirtatious way. Wesley claimed that when they arrived at the park, they kissed, things escalated, and eventually they engaged in sexual activity. He reported to the court that it appeared like Keeley was enjoying herself. He said that the surveillance footage did not show Keeley attempting to escape from him in any manner. He asserted that it was only play fighting on their part. Wesley said, however, that he did cause Keeley's death by putting his arm around her neck during an act of passion. He claimed this was done by mistake. He claims that he dumped the body in the pond and returned to the location five more times to cover Keeley with branches. His defence attorney questioned him about the reason that he previously lied. Street said in court, I didn't know how to act and explain to other people how she died because I felt embarrassed in myself and very scared. To explain to police, everyone, my mum and dad, everyone. His account, however, was not supported by the prosecution's evidence. The prosecution said she had been out the night before, Wednesday through to Thursday, with two friends. One of them, the Crown say, proved to be rather better than the other. The second was this defendant, Wesley Street. Although Keeley had left their friend's home to make her way home in the early hours of the morning, she did not return on what should have been a walk of perhaps 20 minutes or so across the centre of Tamworth. She did not answer her telephone. She had not been to a job interview she was due to attend on Thursday, and nobody but nobody had seen her. At about 5.30pm that Thursday, her father Christopher reported her missing to the police, and searches were organised. He added, it was Keeley's uncle Jason who found her body at about 9pm that night. It was laying face down in a pool, fringed by small trees and bushes at the edge of an area of parkland in Tamworth. It had been hidden by a latticework of branches that had been taken from surrounding vegetation. Her clothing was in disarray. Her black leggings and underwear had been pulled down and they were twisted over and around to cover her trainers. It was obvious from the state of her clothing that she had been sexually assaulted. Keely Bunker was 4 foot 11 inches tall. She weighed just 6.5 stone and she had turned 20 only 12 days before. The police identified the last person reported seeing Keely alive was this defendant, Wesley Street. He added, during the course of that Thursday, a day of mounting dread for the people who loved Keely, he, the defendant, had been telling people, Keeley's family, her true friends and the police, that he had walked her to a telephone box near his home earlier that morning. And there, they had parted company. He even showed police the route that he said that they had taken and where they parted. It was a lie. CCTV was found that showed it was a lie. Analysis of his telephone showed it was a lie. DNA showed it was a lie. And he admits now that it was a lie. Because the truth, we suggest on behalf of the prosecution, was that he had taken Keeley Bunker's life and he sexually assaulted her. She, a young woman, who had trusted him. The scratch marks found on Keeley's neck were said to be where she had scratched herself in a desperate attempt to free herself from Wesley's hold. It was their contention that Keeley had never considered Wesley as anything more than a friend, but that he desired more from the relationship, and that he did not take no for an answer when she refused him. It was revealed to the court that Keeley's death would have taken minutes, not seconds. Street showed no real signs of remorse. In fact, after the attack, Wesley went home to bed and slept. The jury deliberated for around eight hours. Wesley Street was found guilty. He was given a life sentence with the requirement that he serve a minimum of 29 years and 46 days behind bars. The judge informed Wesley... 
you may never be released as that will only occur when the parole board is satisfied it is no longer necessary for the protection of the public that you should be confined. Even if you are released, you will remain on licence and subject to recall for life. Following this case, the true character of Wesley Street was further revealed. Keeley was not his only victim. I welcome the outcome of this week's conviction and today's sentencing and hope it will bring some comfort to Keeley's friends and family. This devious and manipulative character, someone who repeatedly lied and targeted young women, is now behind bars and I'm grateful to every single person who helped us reach this conclusion. In particular, the three young women who have shown immense bravery in coming forward. As much as I welcome today's sentencing, our thoughts are with Keeley's family, friends and the local community who have lived every minute of this horrendous ordeal. We know the hurt won't go away, but we would like to praise Keeley's families and friends for the dignity and respect they have shown throughout the investigation and the court case. Thank you. When the case was made public, more victims felt empowered to come forward with various accusations of indecent assaults, including non-consensual assaults against a minor. For all of us, our teenage years are a short yet defining period of our lives. Years that are equally exciting, stressful and dramatic, but all too fleeting. A seven year gateway to adulthood. A lead in to a new beginning, filled with new experiences and new responsibilities. For a few unfortunate souls, however, their teenage years are not the beginning of the journey. They are the end. The case of Leanne Tiernan contains distressing details and information that may be unsuitable for some viewers. Viewer discretion is advised. Leanne Tiernan was born on the 27th of September 1984 in Leeds, West Yorkshire in the United Kingdom. Leanne grew up surrounded by strong women. Her mother Sharon and sister Michelle used to be taken for days out to Ilkley, a spa town also in West Yorkshire by grandmother Hilary. Sister Michelle was the quieter, more tomboyish of the pair and Leanne was more sociable, traditionally girly and more delicate in her way. In the words of her grandmother, Leanne was very careful. If she thought she might get hurt, she wouldn't do it. She was quite a contented child. You didn't have to always be doing something with her. She was quite happy. Her mother Sharon said that Leanne was a tidy girl who liked to have her space just how she liked it. She said she didn't care about the rest of the house but her bedroom was always dusted and polished and vacked. As Leanne hit her teenage years, she grew into a bright and fun loving girl a teenager that still enjoyed spending time with her family. She was known as easy to talk to, she got on with almost everyone. At a time where many teenagers drift away from their family, her mother said of her, she was very thoughtful, she knew everybody's birthdays, and she used to panic if she didn't have enough money to go and buy somebody a card. She was very, very loyal to her friends, always put them first. If anyone was having a party, she liked to be there. She liked dancing. Leanne's outgoing ways meant she also enjoyed doing some amateur modelling through her teenage years. In an interview, her sister Michelle said about her, she made everyone she met feel welcome. She had a way with people. By November the 26th in the year 2000, Leanne was now 16 years old and living in Bramley, West Yorkshire. Bramley was a small residential district of West Leeds, just a few miles from the city. Although small, it had a strong sense of community. Leanne was attending West Leeds High School and approaching her GCSE exams in just a few months time. Leanne now had a serious boyfriend. He was 19 years old. His name was Wayne Keeley, a man that worked as a care assistant. With Christmas just a month away, Leanne and her friend Sarah Whitehouse, aged 15, had spent the day shopping for presents for their loved ones in Leeds city centre. The pair returned to Bramley on the bus, as they always did. Upon leaving the bus together, Leanne and Sarah reached the point where they were to split up, at the corner of Howley Lane, to return to their respective homes. Sarah watched as Leanne walked down Howley Gill, an unlit path that passed through some wooded wasteland. 
Leanne walked out of Sarah's view and the two continued on home. Sarah called Leanne's house when she got home and was shocked to learn that she wasn't there. When Leanne's mother Sharon called her mobile phone at 5.20pm to inquire about her location, after just four rings the phone was disconnected. Sharon continued to try to contact Leanne. Having no luck in doing so, she called the police at 7pm and reported her daughter missing. Sharon had a bad feeling. She said, if Leanne wasn't home by 10 o'clock, she won't be back. Detective Superintendent Chris Gregg of the West Yorkshire Police promptly launched a missing persons investigation. As the investigation gained speed, it grew to be one of the biggest that West Yorkshire Police had ever conducted involving up to 200 officers and hundreds of volunteers. More than 1,400 house-to-house -house inquiries were made. 800 houses along her likely route home after splitting with Sarah, a route named the Red Route by police, 800 sheds, garages and outbuildings, as well as 150 businesses within a half mile of Howley Hill were all searched. In conjunction with the investigation, 140 males from the area were questioned by the police. And as part of the investigation, 12 search warrants were performed at various locations around Leeds. Between Spring Garden Lock and Bramley Falls, a three mile stretch of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal was drained to a depth of one metre and was then searched by the West Yorkshire Police Underwater Search Squad. Yorkshire Water, the utility company, was contacted to assist in locating abandoned drains and wells. The search team also inspected 32 drain shafts in the vicinity. To enable police to investigate all bins in the area for evidence, residential rubbish collection was briefly suspended. British Waterways, British Transport Police, the Ministry of Defence's Aerial Division and the Police National Search Centre all provided support to the investigation. In an effort to jog the memories of prospective witnesses to Leanne's movements, police conducted a reenactment of the girl's final movements on December the 3rd, 2000. Leanne's friend Sarah Whitehouse and Leanne's elder sister Michelle bravely performed the role of the girls. Detectives also texted Leanne's cell phone, which was off at the time but had briefly been turned on on November the 27th, 2000. Leanne was also featured on milk cartons distributed in Iceland grocery shops across the country. A local businessman also generously offered a £10,000 reward for information that led to Leanne's safe return. Although there were claims of sightings in Doncaster and Blackpool, there had been no conclusive reports of sightings nine months later. Leanne's boyfriend, Wayne Keeley, publicly begged her to contact him. Wayne's pleading was unsuccessful. Police made an e-fit facial composite of a male who had been observed walking a dog just before Leanne vanished. The e-fit was released to the public on December the 4th, 2000. This was around two weeks since Leanne was last seen. The attached description went as follows. 5 feet 8 inches tall and of stocky build with a round reddish face that may possibly be scarred. Wearing a black woolen hat, a 3 quarter length waterproof jacket and dirty jeans. Almost 10 months passed before there was any meaningful progress with Leanne's case. Now on Monday, August 20th, 2001, a man named Mark Bisson was walking his two dogs through Lindley Woods, a forested area in North Yorkshire. Mark Bisson discovered a body of a young woman. The body was placed into a duvet cover with a flowery design. Underneath that, the body was wrapped in nine green plastic rubbish bags fastened with twine, and a black bin bag was fastened around her head with a leather dog collar. The police had to employ the use of fingerprints to identify the remains. Two long days later, on August the 22nd, 2001, the body was confirmed to be that of Leanne. Leanne's black boots and a less coat were not discovered with the body. These same plastic cable ties had also been used to bind her hands. She was also wearing a scarf that was described as dark in colour, 
around her neck. The ponytail she had before she vanished was still in place, and her hair was secured with the same band and hair clips. Detective Superintendent Greg said that the missing persons investigation had now changed to a murder probe. The fact that Leanne's fingerprints were identifiable after 10 months may have surprised you. Forensic specialists speculated, based on Leanne's body condition, that she had been kept in cold storage or a freezer shortly following her death, up until a few weeks before the body was discovered. Police issued a public plea to anyone who may have recently visited Lindley Woods, or who may have knowledge of others who frequent the area, to come forward and to get in touch. In response to West Yorkshire Police's request for information, two previous girlfriends of a man named John Taylor, who had met him through Lonely Hearts columns, independently provided the police with his identity. They both said that he had driven by the woods in their company and boasted of often hunting there. The investigation delved into Taylor's past. Within a mile of where Leanne was last seen alive, John Taylor, born August the 27th, 1956, worked as a parcel delivery driver for Parcel Force and resided in the same housing estate as Leanne, less than a mile away. In 1977, John got married to Janet. The couple moved into their home on Cockshot Drive in May 1982 after having two children together. Taylor's houseproud wife grew unhappy with the marriage. The dissolution of the marriage was partly as a result of John's fixation with animals. John lived alone since his wife divorced him in 1996. John Taylor was well known in the local area. He was referred to as the pet man in the community because he had several dogs, ferrets, other pets, sold pet food and was a noted poacher. Taylor also kept owls, which he fed baby chicks. He would buy the chicks in bulk, and he needed multiple large chest freezers to store them. His sole prior conviction was for stealing a suit at the age of 15. His acquaintances thought he was trustworthy, and overall was described as average. Taylor was a regular user of Lonely Hearts adverts, the police learned. The police were able to identify the women he had spoken to in this way through his telephone records and they started interviewing them. One former girlfriend of Taylor revealed that he enjoyed tying up and locking women in a cupboard. Another said that Taylor had admitted to having a penchant for bondage, whips and ties and that he intended to use cable ties to bind the woman's daughter and engage in sexual activity with her. One of Taylor's former lovers, who had also lived with him for a short time, admitted to the police that she had gone to Lindley Woods with him frequently while they were dating, and that she had ended their relationship because of his bondage obsession. When questioned by authorities about how Taylor would tie her up, she detailed his method of tying her hands behind her back by first attaching a plastic cable tie over each of her wrists, and then connecting them together with a third cable tie. This was noticed to be a similar manner in which Leanne was discovered. Additionally, she claimed that Taylor kept a collection of these cable ties, which he got from work, in a drawer behind his bed. However, these character witnesses would not be reliable or convincing enough evidence to move the case towards a conviction. Investigators now look deeper into the items that were found along with Leanne's body. A Nottingham-based business produced a leather dog collar that was discovered on Leanne's body and was found to be distributed to 220 different wholesalers. Detective Constable David Wilson started getting in touch with each of these wholesalers to find out whether they had any documentation of sales to people in the Leeds region. A Liverpool-based mail order business called Pets Pajamas was the 112th business contacted. They acknowledged making three transactions in the region and sent investigators an email with a list of their customers. One of the customers' names was Taylor, the name given to the police by multiple women. Detective Superintendent Greg made the connection. Taylor was very much a person of interest. The police delved even deeper. 
A hair that did not belong to Leanne was discovered on the scarf that had been put around her neck by forensic scientists from the Forensic Science Service or FSS. The FSS used mitochondrial DNA testing inside of the hair shaft since standard DNA testing was unable to recover a DNA profile from the hair's root. Taylor's DNA profile was compared to the evidence. The hair was a match. An FSS investigation of the twine used to bind Leanne revealed that it was a special kind of twine that could only be produced by a business in Devon, England. A tiny one-off batch of the products were typically exclusively sent to the Ministry of Defence, but had subsequently been made available to the general public for use as rabbit traps. Similar twine was later discovered at Taylor's house, a man that was proud of his poaching. Testing showed that this belonged to the same batch. Another match, and yet more evidence. It was discovered that the yellow cable ties recovered on Leanne's body were made by an Italian business. They sold 99% of them to the Royal Mail, a division of which was Taylor's employer, Parcel Force. When Taylor's residence was examined by authorities, the identical cable ties were discovered, just as his ex-partner had stated. The evidence was building. In Taylor's house, they also discovered green plastic that matched the material that had been used to wrap Leanne's body. The FSS regarded the red nylon carpet fibre traces found on Leanne's body as being particularly identifiable. This was due to the odd process that had been used to dye the fibre. When authorities examined Taylor's residence, the carpets were missing. When probed, they found that he had very recently removed all of the carpeting and disposed of it in a fire. However, fortunately for the case, unfortunately for Taylor, tiny fragments of carpet fibres that matched those on the body were discovered stuck on nails used to secure floorboards. A forensic pollen specialist that the FSS hired found pollen traces on Leanne's skin, in her hair and in her nasal cavity. With this evidence, they were able to match plants from Taylor's garden to this pollen. This suggested that Leanne had been there right before her death. Just over two months since Leanne's remains were discovered, Taylor was detained on October the 16th, 2001 on suspicion of murder. Police cordoned off his home, garden and a section of waste ground behind his property. Police detectives and forensic experts descended on the property for a 10 day in-depth search. The home contained three sizeable chest freezers, large enough to contain a body. The garden held some horrifying secrets that did not help the case for his innocence. Fewer than a mile away from Leanne's home, Taylor had scores of dead animals buried on his property. Along with a mass grave of ferrets, they also discovered a number of deceased dogs. Some had brutally fractured skulls. The evidence against Taylor was becoming increasingly overwhelming. The interrogation began. Taylor confessed to abducting Leanne. He said that he hadn't been to Howley Gill in a long time, but he just happened to be there on the day that Leanne vanished. An unfortunate coincidence. He said that Leanne walked past him, and in an instant he decided to act on his impulsions. He said he grabbed her from behind, he took his jacket and wrapped it around Leanne's head, Perhaps at this moment, Taylor thought he may let Leanne live, so stopping her from getting a good look at him would be beneficial. Taylor said that he tied Leanne's hands behind her back with a dog lead. He then forced her to walk to his house on the adjacent Cockshot Drive. After that, he dragged her into his bedroom. He then pushed Leanne onto the bed. 16-year-old Leanne fought for her life against Taylor. Taylor said that as Leanne struggled, she fell off the bed, hitting her head on the floor. Taylor asserted that she died as a result of this accident. The scarf that was found around Leanne's neck, Taylor said, was used to move the body. Taylor said that he panicked and dumped Leanne's body in the woods. However, the police and prosecution asserted a different course of events to Taylor. 
they said he bound her hands behind her back in the bedroom in anticipation of R-wording her, before using a cable tie as a ligature to strangle her to death when her blindfold came off and Liam was able to look into the face of her killer. When authorities questioned Taylor about his story of transferring Leanne's body to Lindley Woods immediately after the murder and during a panic, he changed his story. He said that in reality he had concealed her first beneath some pallets in his garden before then placing her inside his sofa. Taylor, when asked by police why he did what he did, he responded, I have no idea. He said that he had been drinking and he snapped. On the 15th of February 2002, John Taylor appeared before Mr Justice Paul at Leeds Crown Court and entered a plea of guilty. John Taylor was subsequently convicted with Leanne's murder. The judge who delivered the punishment, Mr Justice Astill, stated, You were not acting on impulse. You chose a secluded place and a vulnerable young girl who suited your purposes. This was as cold and calculating as can be imagined. You must expect to spend the rest of your life in custody. Historic DNA evidence has since forced the reopening of 10 cases of assault, R-word and murder around the UK in connection with Taylor. John Taylor currently resides in HM Prison, Wakefield. What I can say at the moment is, this is a homicide, murder investigation. As human beings, we find comfort in identifying patterns, routines and predictabilities. If we can identify a pattern, then we can use that knowledge to stay safe, to stay secure and to prosper. It's how we have made it as far as we have as a race. We find comfort in the seasons, the holidays, the milestones. Our life goes ever onwards in a sphere of warmth and security and the belief that it will always continue in this way. However, all of this perceived certainty can be thrown off course by one thing, the unpredictability of our fellow human beings. This is the story of Paige Doherty. Viewer discretion is advised. Pamela Munro and John Bothwell welcomed daughter Paige into the world on the 17th of April 2000. Paige Doherty grew up in Clydebank in Scotland. Clydebank is a town situated by the River Clyde in West Dunbartonshire, with a population of around 25,000, eight miles from central Glasgow. In March 2016, Paige lived with her mother Pamela and now stepfather Andy Munro, her younger sister and two younger brothers. Mother Pamela said that Paige was like a second mother to her siblings. Paige adored her parents, her siblings and her stepfather Andy, even going as far to say that he was the best thing that had happened to their family. Now 15 years old, Paige stood at just 4 foot 8 inches tall. Paige was naturally blonde but opted to dye her hair brunette. Paige worked as a part-time hairdresser at a salon in Kirk and Tillock. She would wake up early on Saturday mornings and take two different buses to get there because she enjoyed it so much. Paige now had a boyfriend called Dylan. Paige's world was beginning to open up into something bigger and more exciting. On the 18th of March, Paige spent the night at her best friend Lauren Mills' house. The 15 year old spent their evening blow drying each other's hair and practicing the skills that Paige had learned while working her part time job in the salon. According to a member of Lauren's family, both girls had their hearts set on becoming hairdressers and they spent their weekends making plans for the future. The family member described how Paige was in a carefree and happy state of mind. He said, Paige came round in the evening, as she would do quite often, and she was in a great mood, which was typical for her. The two of them are really into beauty treatments and totally focused on getting jobs in salons, so it was their hobby too. They went into Lauren's room and they started blow drying each other's hair and trying new stuff and trying to learn as much as they could. 
They said that the two girls were happy and full of life on that night. The family member added, there was absolutely nothing in Paige's behavior to suggest that she was afraid of anything or that there was anything on her mind. There was nothing to suggest that anybody might want to do her harm. No clue whatsoever that anything bad might happen. Paige made plans for the following evening. She planned to stop by her friend Chloe's house to manicure her nails, further working on her dreams. Lauren's family member added, she wasn't the kind of teenager to hang around the streets and she definitely wouldn't do drugs or anything like that. On the morning of Saturday, March the 19th, Paige left Lauren's house and walked to the bus stop. Situated behind the bus stop were a row of five small shops. She went to a small deli named Delicious Deli as part of her routine to buy a filled bread roll to eat for breakfast before boarding the bus to work. Paige's mother dropped off Paige's younger sister at a dance class that morning. As far as she was concerned, Paige was heading to work from her friend's house where she stayed the night before. Although at this time she hadn't heard from Paige, she believed that this was because she might have forgotten her phone charger. No alarm bells were rung. However, Dylan, Paige's boyfriend, began to grow concerned that he hadn't heard from Paige all morning. By now, she should have been at work, and ordinarily, she would contact her boyfriend to let him know she was there, and to provide any updates or just to chat during the day. Like most teenagers, Paige was good at replying to messages and comments. Dylan and Paige had had no fights or no fallings out. Their relationship was in a good state. By noon, Dylan felt that he had to dig a little deeper into Paige's whereabouts. When he realised that this gap in their communication was unusual, he phoned the hairdressers, Paige's employer, to see how Paige was. Paige's boss answered the phone and shared the news with Dylan that Paige had never arrived at work that morning. Dylan reached a new level of worry that led him to contact Paige's mother, Pamela. Pamela said... Soon as I knew she wasn't in work, that's when I knew something was up, because she never lets anybody down. Pamela now dismissed her original theory that daughter Paige had forgotten her charger, and that's why she hadn't heard from her. Dylan went on to check Paige's social media accounts for any new activity. This was at a time where you could see other people's activity on Instagram, but Paige's profiles lay dormant since the previous night. The lack of contact plus the lack of social media activity was the final straw for her loved ones. Mother Pamela's gut instinct kicked in and she contacted the police. Somewhere between friend Lauren's house and the hairdressers, Paige vanished. Paige Doherty was now officially a missing person. News of Paige's disappearance spread quickly in the small community. Paige's friends and relatives quickly spread the news on Facebook and generated hundreds of posters asking for any information on her whereabouts. Paige was very loved. An organised search for Paige began, made up of teams of both police officers and willing local volunteers. The search team spread out over the local area as police investigators retraced Paige's probable route to work. They arrived at the bus stop where they knew she normally caught the bus. The bus stop situated in front of the block of five shops. One of those shopkeepers was Ashi Ahmed. Ashi, who runs the Fleming food store in White Crook, said he saw the schoolgirl at around 8.15am on the Saturday morning going into the delicious deli next door to buy a roll. Ashi said, Paige came walking past right by the door and I waved at her and she put her hand up to wave back. She'd been in the week before and bought a roll, but on Saturday she went into Johnny's next door to get one. I spoke to John later and he said that she was cheery and bright, the way she always is. The John or Johnny referred to here is a man named John Letham, the owner of Delicious Deli. Ashi Ahmed was able to back up his claims by submitting his CCTV footage from that time. Later, Ashi added, We have been here for more than 20 years and we've known Paige all her life. The local community wanted Paige back. On March the 20th, police kept looking in the local area. They talked to potential witnesses and appealed to the public for their assistance in returning Paige home. However, there was still no sign from 15-year-old Paige. Her phone, her social media, all laid silent. 
speculation that Paige had run away from home, from a life that she loved, and perhaps that she was pregnant, were quickly disputed and denied by her family. This was a young girl of small stature, without a lot of money or the means to run away and start a new life. The Help Find Page Facebook page quickly gained followers. It shared information on Paige's appearance, her clothing that she wore the day she went missing, her normal route to work, all in the hope of jogging someone's memory that may be able to help. On March the 21st, the CCTV footage from Ashley Ahmed's store was further scrutinised by the police. Due to the nature of the investigation, police took a three-hour sample of footage from around the time that Paige was seen by Ashi. Other police officers were interviewing Paige's family in her home. At this early stage into a missing persons investigation, the police tried to move quickly, especially when the person is young or vulnerable. Further police officers were searching the home for clues that could reveal anything about Paige's whereabouts. However, suddenly at around noon, the police interviewing the family stopped asking questions. A body had been found. It was found just half a mile from where Paige was last seen. Early signs showed the body to be that of a 20-year-old woman. The family were put at a strange sense of ease. However, Pamela already knew in her heart that something bad must have happened to her beloved daughter. At this time, there were several missing young women in that area. So without officially identifying the body, the search for Paige would continue. Pamela said that this time was her worst nightmare. The body was found in a wooded area of Great Western Road's entrance road, close to the world of golf. A walker raised the alarm after spotting what he believed to be human legs in the undergrowth. Forensic teams blocked off and searched the area. Later that evening, the 20-year-old woman, whose body it was believed to be, turned up safe and well. Pamela's gut feelings about her daughter grew stronger. On March the 22nd, police identified the body as that of 15-year-old Paige. The first thing that I, I really want to say is uh, my condolences go uh, to the family and friends of Paige. Uh, clearly this is an extremely harrowing time for the family and friends uh, and I really just want to say my heart goes out to them. At this present time, a post-mortem examination will commence this afternoon to allow us to understand exactly what the cause and the circumstances of the case deaths. What I can say at the moment is this is a homicide, murder investigation and Paige was assaulted. The following was written by Pamela on Facebook. Myself and Andy Munro would like to thank everyone for their support and help in trying to find our daughter. Unfortunately, we can confirm that it is our beautiful daughter Paige who was found in Clydebank. Again, thank you for all your support. I am seeing everyone's messages, but understandably, we've got a lot on our minds and can't reply. We are absolutely devastated, as many people who knew her will be. Shortly after the body was announced to be that of Paige, well-wishers began to place flowers and notes beside the road. One tribute read, R.I.P. This is so sad. A young life taken too soon. Thoughts are with family and friends. And now no one is safe as someone is still out there. Hope they get caught very quickly. Rest in peace, little lady. Signed, Worried Dad of Five Girls. The ever-helpful shopkeeper, Ashi Ahmed, made this video in an effort to aid the inquiry further. I was one of the last guys to see Paige alive, and I put my hand up to the to her and I said to her, you all right? And she replied back, I am all right, I'll see you later on, Ashi. And that was the last word she said to me. I hope you can catch the killer, please. I'm appealing to you to find the killer for us. Thank you very much. The post-mortem revealed over 100 injuries many of which were deemed to be defensive in character, as Paige valiantly fought off her attacker. As a personal note for me, I find the thoughts of Paige fighting for her life to be incredibly powerful. I also find it to be one of the most upsetting parts about these cases, and I can't quite put my finger on why that is, but it really is just heartbreaking to think of. I have a huge respect for anyone that defends themselves in these situations, and I feel proud of Paige for doing what she did. Paige's mother disputes the facts that were released to the public, and believes the number of injuries to be nearer to 500. The injuries were thought to be made by multiple, at least three, sharp objects. The sharp objects are thought to range from knives to scissors to screwdrivers. 
On March the 23rd, the delicious deli in Whitecrook, where Page was last seen, is cordoned off by forensic police. A white forensics tent used to preserve evidence from being contaminated was erected outside the deli at 8.45pm. Police in Clybank also sealed off a neighbouring street and started searching vehicles and a home. On March the 24th, the owner of Delicious Deli, John Letham, is detained for questioning by the police. On the evening of the same day, the iconic Titan Crane in Clydebank is lit up using pink lighting in a tribute to Page. On March the 25th, during interrogation, John Letham denies having anything to do with Page's case. So are you adamant we will find no forensic evidence linking you to Page Doherty? You sure about that? Did you see positive? Is that because you, you did murder things talking to a friend? I'm going to charge you. You join Lethem at Delicious Deli. They'd repeatedly attack, strike, and stab the deceased to the face, neck, and arms, and you did murder her. Do you understand the charge? Have you anything to say? Hmm. What's going on in that shop? She's going into the your shop that morning to buy a roll for her breakfast and she never walks out of that shop again. And what has caused Paige Doherty to be in that state? You're the only person who's been in and out of that shop. You're the only person who can tell us what happened. However, police look to move forwards with their case against John Letham via the Crown Prosecution Service. On March the 26th, John Letham appeared in court, accused of killing Paige Doherty. Throughout a private hearing at Dumbarton Sheriff Court, the deli owner offered no plea and no declaration. On April the 4th, the cause of death is verified. Following the autopsy and coroner's investigations, a definitive cause of death was announced. According to the death certificate, she suffered sharp force injuries to her neck, severing vital arteries. On April the 12th, following an attack on the family home by angry local residents, John Letham's wife flees with a young child. A neighbour of the Lethams said, The police sat outside the home 24 hours a day. There was a lot of anger among people here because Paige was well known and very popular. Some of the youngsters were quite open about smashing the windows of the flat as soon as the police moved out. So it would have been difficult for a young mother to return here. One month after Paige's passing, mourners assembled at St Margaret's Church in Clydebank to bid farewell. Paige was transported to the chapel in a carriage drawn by two white horses. Around 300 family members, friends and well-wishers followed in a procession. The procession was followed by a private service and burial for those closest to Paige. What is thought to have occurred to Paige Doherty on the day she vanished is as follows. Paige left her friend's house and walked to the bus stop. She walked past Ashi Ahmed's shop, exchanged pleasantries, and then moved on to the Delicious Deli. At 8.21am, she walked into the Delicious Deli. This was captured on CCTV. As a disturbing note, Pamela, Paige's mother, used to frequently buy food from this deli after dropping Paige's little sister off at daycare during the week. After entering the shop, the attack quickly took place and Paige was either incapacitated or was already dead. After around 10 minutes, Letham closed the shop's blinds. At this point, it is believed that he either went on to continue the attack or to finally take Paige's life. A hairdresser that worked locally at a different hair salon to the one that Paige was employed at visited the deli and attempted to see through the windows. The deli's blinds were closed, but the business didn't appear to be fully open or fully closed for business. This is something that caused more interest in the premises than it just being open as usual. Letham saw the woman and put forward a story that a job applicant hadn't turned up. He said, Oh, what a morning. The lassie didn't turn up. I had a nosebleed and I need to collect my car. John Letham then left his premises and went to an adjacent shop. He purchased a number of suspicious products, bin bags, gloves, bleach, cleaner and wipes. He then returned to the deli and wrapped Paige's body in bin liners. He then collected and moved his car to the front of the shop. 
concealed in bin bags, Lethem bought Page's body out of the front of his shop and placed it in the trunk of his car. Lethem is alleged to have nearly run into a little boy whilst carrying Page's body to his car. This is visible in unreleased CCTV footage. On this footage, Page's foot wearing a white sock was visible poking out of the black plastic. He then got in his car and left. Bear in mind that there were four more shops on the same block as Delicious Deli. Although it was early, business owners, patrons and other members of the public were nearby. It really is quite surprising that he didn't get caught at this early stage. After leaving the deli, Page's body wasn't taken to the place where it was found. Instead, Lethem returned to his home. He moved Page's body into his garden shed. He cleaned himself up changed into fresh clothing and then returned to the scene of the crime. That day, he kept his business open until 3.15pm. John Lethem, in a truly disturbing move, took his wife and child on a short family holiday to Balmahar. Upon returning, he didn't move Paige from his shed until March the 21st, the same day that she was discovered. Lethem's car was seen by CCTV cameras passing by the forested area along the access road, which is close to the location that Page was found. This was between 6 and 7 o'clock in the morning. Less than half a mile separated the site from Lethem's deli. In an effort to ensure that there was no forensic evidence linking him to the death, he thoroughly cleaned his car. Later that day, Page was found. The following day, Lethem was arrested. John Lethem entered a guilty plea at Glasgow's High Court on September the 5th, 2016. John Lethem testified to authorities during his trial that Page had entered his business and was requesting a job. Lethem said that he rejected the teen's request, saying that he had other candidates to interview. He claimed that Page said, once she was declined, that she would tell everyone that he had essayed her if he didn't give her the job. Lethem said that his response to the girl's statements had admittedly been a gross overreaction. He said that this is because he had a family member that had been listed on the sex offenders registry, and he was afraid that if Page started accusing him, he too would be added to the list. He claimed that he feared he would lose everything if this happened. Lethem recalled Page saying, I thought I was getting a job. I will just say that you touched me. As a quick note from me, this seems like an obvious lie. Paige loved her work as a hairdresser. This was proven by her dedication to her job, and to be honest with you, all of her behaviour. She made plans to work in the beauty industry, that was her plan. Why would she suddenly want to give that up and instead work at a deli? It doesn't make any sense. I find this to be a really, really weak excuse. Really poor. Lethem claims that Paige then began to scream loudly in an effort to gain attention from anyone nearby. Lethem said that he then attacked her to protect his reputation and his business, and to silence her screams. The family of Paige Doherty gave victim impact statements in court. Pamela Pamela, Paige's mother, spoke in court about how devastated she was to lose her child. Pamela said that she had been experiencing terrifying dreams, night terrors and sleeplessness since Paige had been taken. She testified in court how thoughts of her daughter screaming in panic and pain would wake her up in the night. Pamela would then be repeatedly forced to face the reality that she couldn't do anything to rescue her daughter. Andrew Munro, Paige's stepfather, also spoke in court about how he had been dealing with severe depression ever since Paige was taken. Paige's grandmother described her as a kind and selfless person and all-round good girl. Today we see a monster put behind bars for the unthinkable brutal crime he committed against our daughter Paige. A beautiful 15-year-old with a full life ahead of her and a massive family and group of friends are left to carry on with her no longer here. There is no sentence high enough to justify what has happened, but we can now say there is one less evil man in this world. John Lethem was sentenced at the High Court in Glasgow on October the 12th, 2016, which was seven months after the murder of Paige Doherty. Judge Lady Ray set a minimum sentence of 27 years in prison. She remarked, this was a savage, frenzied attack on a child. Judge Lady Ray continued by stating that Lethem's mental health had been examined and that there was no obvious psychological or psychiatric reasons for why Lethem carried out the crime. What you did was truly reprehensible. It is impossible to comprehend how an apparently happily married man with a young child who's running a successful business is capable of such an horrific level of violence. 
Detective Superintendent Duncan Sloan also said the following about the investigation. The CCTV footage, coupled with extensive forensic examinations of the crime scenes, helped to establish what happened to Paige and who was responsible. I am sure that the sheer weight of this evidence has led to the guilty plea at court today. Our thoughts remain with Paige's family, whose vibrant, bright young daughter has been cruelly taken away from them at just 15 years of age. Paige's whole future lay ahead of her and her life has been brutally cut short by the vicious actions of one man. Letham then appealed his conviction in February of 2017. His lawyer argued that Letham's punishment was far too severe. Attorney Ian Dugwood said that John Letham was a first-time offender. In addition, he mentioned that Letham was a married man and father of a small child, and that the murder had been spontaneous, and that he had never committed a crime like this. Letham wanted his regret for the crime to be considered in his appeal. Letham got his sentence lowered to a mandatory minimum of 23 years in prison. Page's memory lives on. Pamela subsequently set up Page's Promise. The website describes it as follows. Page's Promise is a charitable organisation set up honouring Page Doherty, who was taken too soon in March 2016. We aim to help other families in similar circumstances. As we expand, we want to offer financial assistance to families towards funeral costs or expenses incurred while off work to cover bills. Our aim is to help families or anyone else who is going through tragic circumstances and needs to gain peace and harmony in their life. August 2018 proved just how hard Paige's death hit her family. There are always multiple victims, even if only one life was taken. Paige Doherty's father passed away. Paige's grandmother, Roseanne Bothwell, 71, said that her son died of a broken heart. Paige's mother, Pamela, shared what she believed Paige would be saying now. She would be saying to everybody, don't dwell on this, don't be sitting sad and being upset, don't put off your life. She'd say, just forget about the person that did this, make more time for family and don't argue as much. Life is far too short. Sometimes in life you come across someone that seems to have it all. They have the looks, they have the personality, they are successful at work and their colleagues love them. They have a strong network of family and friends that support them through their life. It is hard to imagine someone like this as anything but untouchable or even invincible. Some flames burn so brightly that you can't imagine them ever going out. Much like being outside in the height of summer, the sun beating on your face, winter feels like a vaguely distant possibility, not worth thinking about. You can't imagine a world without these special people even less that they will be taken by another human. This is the case of Tara Grinstead. Viewer discretion is advised. Here at Dark Case Documentaries, we release at least one new true crime video every week. Please join the Dark Case family by hitting the subscribe button now. If you would like to further help us in our work, please consider supporting us on Patreon, which is linked in the description. Our love and respect goes out to those that knew and loved Tara. Bill and Faye Grinstead gave birth to daughter Tara in Hawksville, Georgia on November the 14th, 1974. Anita Grinstead, later known as Anita Gattis, was her only sibling, a sister. Tara participated in the Miss Georgia beauty pageant in 1999 and received the title of Miss Tifton. I have been in um, pageants in high school and I had always wanted to go to Miss Georgia and as you know that's a different type of pageant so I worked very hard. Everyone knows being Miss Tifton is like another job and I have worked very hard and to represent Tifton very well and I hope to do very well at Miss Georgia to make, Miss Tif make the Tifton community proud. She was able to pay for college with the profits from from this pageant and the many others that she had taken part in. After graduating from Middle Georgia College in Cochrane, Tara went to Valdosta State University to receive a master's degree in education. She started teaching history at Irwin County High School in Oscilla in 1998. Southwest Georgia's Oscilla is a little community off the main road. 
quiet and often tranquil. The 11th grade teacher at Irwin County High School was well liked, according to both co-workers and students. From the outside, she seemed content and to have a wonderful life. An all-American beauty queen, she was attractive, well-liked, devoted and determined. Bobby Connor, the administrator of Irwin County High School, said, This is someone with a tremendous magnetic personality, and the kids just love her. According to her sister Anita, she was planning a highly promising future and had applied for a history PhD program. Tara, according to her relatives, and like most of us, never left the house without her phone. Tara, who was now 30 years old, went to a beauty pageant on Saturday, October 22nd, 2005. This is where she worked as a coach for young participants. A great opportunity to pass on her experience and knowledge. One of the pageant's organisers, Nora Griffin, recalls running into Tara on that particular day. That was one of the things I asked. Did she seem depressed? Did she seem upset? Not to me at all. She was just everyday Tara. In addition to working as a full-time teacher, Tara also had a number of obligations, including this work as a beauty pageant advisor. She did pageants, she coached girls, she did hair, she did makeup, she was a student at night and she was always on the go, said Nora Griffin. On the 22nd of October, when Tara had finished the coaching sessions, she attended a cookout or barbecue. After sharing a good time, Tara informed her friends at the party that she was going straight home. On Monday, October the 24th, two days after Tara departed from the cookout, she failed to report for work. For Tara, this was very unusual behaviour. Tara's friend, Dina Harper Causey, who happened to be the stepmother of Tara's ex-boyfriend, Marcus Harper, went to check on her. Tara and Dina had chatted briefly during the cookout, but Dina hadn't heard from her since. I saw her um, across the street from my house at Dr. Davis's on his back patio. We were having a cookout. Did you actually go to the cookout that night? I did for a bit. Uh, I, 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 was, I had to leave and go take my mom a plate with when we finished cooking. She assumed that she was feeling unwell or under the weather. Joy Portier, Tara's next door neighbour, was likewise worried for Tara's well-being. Joe was a good neighbour and a friend of Tara. He had a key for Tara's home in case of emergencies. Tara had given it to my wife one, one weekend that she went off and forgot that she might have left some counters on. So she gave my wife a key so we could check on stuff like that for her. And then I would check on her cat and her dog. The one. What door did you use to walk the, the, the front door. The front door. We just kind of went up looking, you know. Yeah, after, after uh, we found that she wasn't in the house. Dina and Joe entered the home and shouted out to Tara, but got no response. Tara wasn't there. Something felt wrong. I walked back out on a porch and I called uh, our chief of police, Billy Hancock. Upon arriving at Tara's home, police began their investigation. The clothing that Tara was wearing at the cookout on Saturday night was heaped on the floor of her bedroom. Her mobile phone was plugged into the power outlet on charge. In the carport outside the home, Tara's car was still parked. However, her keys and her handbag were gone. They promptly contacted the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, or GBI. The small town police force simply didn't have the tools to handle the case that this was about to become. No evidence of forced entry or a struggle was discovered by the GBI. There were no definitive indications of a fight. However, this doesn't mean that something very bad couldn't have happened. We can't rule that out, but there were no obvious signs of violence in the residence, said Gary Rothwell of the GBI. However, Tara's bedside clock was discovered on the floor, and the time it displayed was six hours off. On Tara's nightstand stood a lamp that had been broken in two and propped up against the wall. A latex glove was discovered on the front yard of Tara's home. 
This glove was taken as evidence and sent away for DNA analysis. According to Gary Rothwell, the glove was just a stone's throw from her front stoop. Even though Rothwell did not name the glove's owner as a suspect, Rothwell said, We believe it is a critical element to solving this case. DNA analysis revealed that the glove's owner was a man. Over the course of the investigation, officials attempted to match the DNA source to hundreds of males that may have come into contact with Tara. Rothwell said that the DNA had been entered into the Georgia and national databases, but there were no matches. They could not find their man. Tara's car was found with the doors open, and the driver's seat was pulled back excessively for someone of her stature. This is something that greatly bothered the police. Tara normally kept her seat considerably closer to the steering wheel because she was a small woman, standing at just 5 foot 3 inches tall. Strangely, an envelope filled with $100 in cash was discovered on her dashboard. Both police and Tara's relatives were unable to determine the source of the money or whether it even belonged to Tara. Tara's pet cat and dog were left behind in her home. For someone with a reputation as an animal lover, this was a major red flag. According to friends and family, Tara would never leave her pets without a solid plan of someone to look after them. Tara's older sister, Anita. I cannot even express how my family and our friends, I mean, the outpouring of love for Tara. We knew they loved her. All the guys in our school like Miss Tara. She is beautiful. She is somebody everybody wants to be like, so that might have something to do with it. As the police delved into Tara's background, they discovered that her personal life was not plain sailing. Marcus Harper, stepson of Dina, the lady that went in to check on Tara, had previously been in a relationship with Tara for six years. They had been separated for around a year. Marcus had left town and had only recently come back. Despite having a new partner, Marcus continued calling Tara. A week before her disappearance, the former couple had a big argument. There was one incident when she, she called and was just really upset. And I, they had had a talk and, you know, some things had happened and, and she was so upset I, on the phone and was extremely upset. and was really just sounding incoherent. I, you know, we, I just told her to stop driving and pull over at the little airplane up there and we'd come get her, so that's what we did. Marcus Harper reported that Tara visited him the week prior and begged him to take her back. According to Marcus, that was the last time he saw her. To make the case more complex, Grinstead had lodged a complaint with the police department against one of its officers. Marcus Hopper, her ex-boyfriend, and the police officer were good friends. The two men were spotted together in the officer's patrol car on the night of Tara's disappearance while on a ride-along. This is when a police officer allows a civilian to go out on patrol with them. However, this event has also been described as Marcus being picked up from a bar by his officer friend at around 1am. It is unclear which one, if either, were intoxicated. However, Marcus Hopper was exonerated by the police due to an alibi. Please do let me know your thoughts about this information in the comments. I found it very interesting. A previous male student of Tara's who claimed to have had an affair with her was another person that became a suspect in the inquiry. According to police reports, they had previously detained him after he repeatedly harassed her at her home. These charges were, however, later withdrawn. The GBI's Gary Rothwell remarked, She had been engaged in a couple of romantic relationships. Those were certainly the subject of our focus initially. We have nobody that we can identify as someone that we believe was associated with the disappearance of Tara. That's not to say that anybody we've talked to has been cleared either. Tara was not the type of person, according to her friends and family, to go out on her own without keeping in touch with them. They stressed how out of character for her the events surrounding her disappearance are. The fact that her mobile phone was left in her home was very troubling. Those that knew Tara were certain that she was taken. 
Police were still looking for information that may aid their investigation. A total reward of $200,000 was offered, divided into $100,000 for Tara's safe return and $100,000 for information that results in the capture and conviction of Tara's kidnappers. Police still referred to their investigation as a case of a missing person. Although investigators were not excluding the potential of foul play, they also assert that it's very possible that Tara simply walked away from all the stress in her personal life in the absence of more evidence to the contrary. Three and a half years passed in Tara's case with no major breakthroughs. That is before the footage of a self-described serial killer appeared online in February 2009. Authorities identified Tara Grinstead as one of the 16 women that the man in the recordings, who identified himself as the Catch Me Killer, claimed to have attacked. Despite the man's voice and face being digitally altered in the videos, police were able to identify the man as 27-year-old Andrew Haley. These videos and admissions turned out to be a strange but complex hoax. Andrew Haley was eliminated as a suspect, from the investigation. In 2010, Tara Grinstead was now declared dead, five years after disappearing. In 2011, GBI investigator Rothwell said, this case has never gone cold. He also stated that new leads are constantly coming in on a weekly basis. The case was still active and progressing in 2012. Posters calling for information or tips about Tara's disappearance were posted all throughout the town. Nobody had forgotten about this beloved history teacher and beauty queen. Police investigators drained a pond in the area in search of evidence following a tip. However, this search came up empty. According to Police Chief Billy Hancock, We'll continue to follow up on information and leads that are involved in the information that led us here, and hopefully it will result in something positive for the case. We have conducted an extensive investigation trying to determine her whereabouts and what might have happened to her, and at this point we, we still don't know. A 30-year-old high school history teacher up and seemingly vanished. And even today, people are still asking, what happened to Tara Grinstead? He was somebody that uh, was admired in the community by her peers and by her students as well. Now 11 years after Tara disappeared, the Up and Vanished podcast, which ran from 2016 to 2017, was lauded by both the authorities and in the media with shedding fresh light on the evidence and rekindling public interest in the case. Three years before Tara's disappearance, Bo Dukes and Ryan Alexander Duke were high school classmates at Irwin County High School where Grinstead was employed as a teacher. Confusingly, although their last names are similar, they are not related. However, their similar names did place them next to each other in the high school yearbook. According to the GBI, on February the 23rd, 2017, someone entered a sheriff's office with information that prompted several fresh interviews and Ryan Duke's arrest. As the hours turned into days, days into weeks, weeks into months, and eventually months into years, the search efforts never ceased. Through these 11 plus years, the GBI and other law enforcement officers have received hundreds and hundreds of tips. Duke was taken into custody yesterday afternoon and a warrant was issued this morning. The GBI says that Ryan Duke was never considered a suspect prior to this. Numerous GBI agents searched for Tara's remains on a pecan plantation in Ben Hill County where the suspects are thought to have dumped her body. According to Officer Rixton, through these interviews, enough probable cause was discovered so we could swear out an arrest warrant charging Ryan Alexander Duke with the murder of Tara Grinstead. Bo Dukes was charged with assisting his friend in covering up the murder. This is a possible site where she may have been disposed of, Rixton said. We are finding some things and we are collecting some evidence. We are hopeful that we can find her remains and that's why we're there. 
I can't even put this into words. It's unreal. It's just unbelievable. Tara's sister, Anita Gattis, said. Anita also said that despite knowing Bojuk's family for a long time, she had never associated him in any way with her sister's disappearance. She said that while she was part of the searches for her sister back in 2005, she lived in Oscilla with Bojuk's relatives. They were some of the most heartbroken people in the area over Tara's disappearance, she said. Ryan said in interview that his only intention was to rob Tara. Tara coincidentally returned home and caught Ryan in the act of burglary. In a moment of shock and rage, he turned and swung his fist at Tara. Prior to directing detectives to the pecan plantation where he said that Dukes cremated Tara, Ryan Duke also provided a written statement or confession. During his confession, Ryan Duke also mentioned a latex glove like the one found at Tara's house that contained his DNA. The case had almost come full circle to the evidence found on the investigation's first moments. A grand jury charged Dukes with four new offences in August 2017, two counts of making false statements, one count of obstructing a criminal's capture, and one count of concealing Tara's death were all included in the charges. These further accusations are supported by a Wilcox County indictment that claims Dukes lied to a GBI agent who questioned him about the disappearance of Grinstead in 2016. On March 19th, 2019, Bo Dukes' trial formally opened. On March 22nd, 2019, he was found guilty for his part in the murder's cover-up and received a 25-year jail term. On May the 9th, 2022, Ryan Duke's murder trial got underway. Ryan Duke entered a not guilty plea throughout the trial. Duke told that he lied to the GBI because he was afraid of Dukes. He informed the jurors that Tara was slain by Dukes and not him. Segments of Ryan Duke's police interview were played in court. I can't lie. I can't live with myself. I'm so sick of this. Stealing from her purse. She snuck up on me. I hit her. I don't remember everything clearly. Ryan also testified in court and was asked, Did you see Miss Grinstead's body after she died? I did. Where did you see it? In the pecan orchard. Did somebody take you to the body? They did. Who took you to the body? Bo Jukes. The prosecution said this during their final arguments. The man in that chair confessed to the murder of Tara Grinstead. They burned her body, a full skeleton, down to about 20 fragments of bone. He thought so much of Tara, he burned her like household trash. Ryan Duke was found guilty of concealing a death on May the 20th, 2022 but not of murder, serious assault, or burglary. Duke received the maximum punishment of 10 years in jail three days later. This is Don Sippel calling, and I have a, a, a lady that just came to my house, and somebody attacked her, and she needs a doctor. Her, her clothes are all torn, and yeah, she's injured. Her, her mouth is kind of... Uh, got some blood around it, and her clothes are all torn. Okay, and she's by herself? She's by herself. She walked to my house here just recently. Okay, and can you ask her what her name is? What's your name, ma'am? What? You don't know? She's in kind of bad shape. She just says she don't know. Okay, let me put you on hold. Do not hang up. I'm going to start some help, okay? Sure. A young woman knocked on Don Sipple's door. Her clothes were ripped, she had no shoes on, and she was covered in mud, blood and bruises. The woman said that she could not remember her name or anything else. She had three cuts on the palm of her hand and the word boy was carved into her forearm. Ezra McCandless was born on October the 6th, 1997. Her mother gave birth to her when she was just 14 years old in Stanley, Wisconsin. Her biological father was not in her life. 
However, Ezra was legally adopted by her mother's husband, Josh Carlin, when she was four years old. Ezra's mother and adoptive father then divorced when she was 12. However, her relationship with her adoptive father, Josh, was not strained by this occurrence. They remained close. When Ezra went to high school, she began to explore everything about her identity. She experienced some confusion and dysphoria surrounding her gender. Ezra's birth name was Monica Key, but she no longer felt that this was a good fit. She then legally changed her name to Ezra McCandless. She chose a surname McCandless after Chris McCandless, an American adventurer who sought a nomadic lifestyle. He was famously the subject of the book and movie titled Into the Wild. Ezra then went to college but soon dropped out and moved to Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Eau Claire has a population of around 70,000, making it the 8th largest city in Wisconsin. In the summer of 2017, Ezra was 19 years old when she meets 33-year-old Jason Mengel, a National Guard medic. Their relationship quickly flourished and they moved in together that same summer in August. The 14-year age difference didn't seem to matter. Jason said that Ezra was a very spontaneous and energetic person and that she kept someone like him on its toes. She was full of surprises and enjoyed attracting attention to herself. Ezra described their relationship as one in which they loved each other so intensely that it terrified them both. Ezra was also an artist who enjoyed painting. She would use her car as a canvas, painting different designs all over it. So when she drove it around, she would get the attention that it seemed that she desired from other people. As the couple grew closer, they began discussing marriage. However, they already frequently referred to each other as husband and wife. Grace's coffee shop is popular in Eau Claire. Jason and Ezra frequently visited. There, the couple met Alex Woodworth, a 24-year-old barista. Alex also worked as a substitute teacher after earning a Bachelor of Science degree in philosophy with a minor in biology from the University of Wisconsin. He began applying to graduate school with the ultimate goal of earning his PhD and becoming a philosophy professor. Alex was described as a nice guy, a deep thinker, and philosophy was clearly his passion. His future as a philosophy professor was important to him. He would always have books on the subject on his person, and he was always looking for more recommendations. Alex placed a high value on family. He was the oldest of four children, and his father, John, described him as someone who enjoyed being a big brother. His arms were always draped over his family in photos, keeping them close to him, embracing them. Alex was a devout member of his church and was always willing to assist those in need. He seemed to like all creatures, including bugs and spiders, referring to them affectionately as unlovely because most people didn't like them. Alex always made sure that everyone was taken care of. As long as he was happy with whatever he was doing, that was all that mattered. When Alex first met Ezra and Jason, he wanted to be there for them too, but arguably more so for Ezra. She was going through a difficult emotional time because she discovered she was pregnant with Jason's child in October of 2017, just a few months into the relationship. Ezra knew that she was not ready to take on the role of motherhood and responsibility of having a child. So on October the 6th, 2017, on Ezra's 20th birthday, she and Jason drove to Minneapolis to get a termination. Ezra felt guilty about the procedure. She said that she didn't want Jason to see her go through with it. So Jason wandered the city until Ezra contacted him that she was ready to go home. This ordeal took an emotional and physical toll on Ezra and her connection with Jason. A connection that had been so intense but was gradually fading. Ezra began to grow closer to Alex while slowly drifting away from Jason. Jason stated that Alex and Ezra complimented each other in the sense that Ezra could fix things in Alex's life and Alex could fix things in Ezra's life. Jason became aware that Alex and Ezra were becoming closer. Jason stated that Ezra felt guilty about the termination of her pregnancy, that she was left with a lot of trauma and that she was feeling increasingly isolated. Jason believed that Alex was better equipped to deal with this than he was. Somewhat predictably, Alex and Ezra eventually became more than just friends, and they began having a secret relationship behind Jason's back. 
Jason then spent two weeks training with the National Guard in February of 2018. Before Jason left, he told John Hansen to keep an eye on Ezra to make sure that she was okay. Jason and John became friends after both serving in the military. They shared the same interests, so John was someone that Jason felt he could trust. Ezra, however, took this opportunity to begin yet another intimate relationship, this time with John. During Jason's absence of just two weeks, Ezra called him to inform him that she was leaving their apartment and returning to her family in Stanley, Wisconsin. Ezra and Jason remained in contact and would frequently meet up. Jason would book a hotel room for Ezra and himself to spend time in together. Jason went through Ezra's phone one night once she had fallen asleep. There, he discovered messages from not one, but two different men, Alex and John. Jason stated that he already suspected Ezra of cheating on him with Alex, and that reading the messages only confirmed his suspicions. When Ezra discovered that Jason was aware of her relationships, she told him that the relationship with John was non-consensual. She claimed that the two of them had been drinking one night and had gotten inebriated. She then blacked out, and the attack happened while she was unconscious. Jason went to the police station to file a report, and they then contacted Ezra, who told them the same story that she told Jason, that the two had been drinking, she blacked out, and that is when the attack was carried out. The detective examined her text messages and phone records and discovered that she was lying. According to the text messages, she had told Alex that her relationship with John was consensual, but that she did regret it. As a result, the charges against John were dropped. Jason then confronted both Alex and John about their relationships with Ezra. Jason and Ezra's relationship now ended. At this time, it is widely believed that Ezra also ended her relationship with Alex by texting him and saying that she never wanted to speak to him again. Ezra, according to Jason, was manipulative to all three men, both himself, Alex and John. Ezra wrote to Jason about how bad she felt for betraying him and how much she loved him. She said she wanted to give him the letters in person, but he insisted that they instead be mailed. Jason went to race his coffee shop on March the 22nd, 2018. And whilst there, he noticed Ezra. He said that Ezra appeared agitated, and she stated that she was on her way to Alex's house to drop off a heating pad and a bookmark. Ezra and Jason were still very much in contact. The night before, they exchanged over 600 text messages. For a couple that weren't together, this was still a very intense relationship. Jason mentioned that when Ezra left the coffee shop, she had fire in her eyes. Jason thought it was strange that Ezra told Alex not to talk to her anymore, but now she wanted to return some items to Alex. To him, this felt strange, and Jason had a feeling that something bad was about to happen. Ezra left in her car, and Jason hopped on his bike and rode to Alex's house, hoping to arrive there before she did. When Jason arrived, he noticed that Ezra's 2003 Chevy Impala was already there, engine still running, music playing, and the driver side door was open. Jason didn't know what to do. He paced back and forth for 45 minutes until he entered the house without knocking. When he entered the house, he walked in on Ezra and Alex having a heated argument. But when they saw him, they acted as if nothing happened. You could feel the tension in the air, Jason said. They tried to appear emotionless and calm, but he suspected that something was wrong. That they were pretending everything was fine, but it wasn't. Jason suggested that they instead have this conversation in public. This way, there's a less chance of anything bad happening if they're surrounded by other people. A police officer approached them as they walked out of the house. When a neighbour noticed Jason pacing back and forth and becoming concerned, they called the police. One officer approached Alex near Ezra's car. Another officer was speaking with Jason, and Jason stated, She gave me a vibe today. I don't know. It does not feel right. Something feels wrong. Who's, who's the girlfriend? Ezra McCandless. Okay. I was just worried because, like, was the door standing open over there when you got there on knocked, the car? I knocked, like, three times. I didn't hear anything. I didn't hear a scuffle or okay. anything. So, knocked, knocked, yelled, opened the door, and I heard her say, let him help you. Let him help you. So then I said, hey, is everything okay? Is everyone all right right now? I mean, I'm a medic in the military, so, like, I was paranoid. I was paranoid that someone was going to do something irrational. Okay. 
And they're in the house on the corner here, or yeah, which? they're on. I think they're fine, though. I mean, I don't okay. know. I'm, I'm just. I just saw of, the door to the car was standing open too. Was yeah, open I wanted to turn her car up. Her car was running, so that's why I was like worried because it was running. And I was like, okay, uh, what's going on? Like, what's going on? Is everything okay? Okay. Do you have any ID with you? Yeah. Jason, you live in town? Roger that. Just worried. I don't think he's dangerous, but I don't know. Do you know what his name is? Alex Alex Woodsworth. Okay. Or, 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 yeah, I think it's Woodsworth or Woodsworth. You can go over by your bike. Hi. Is everything okay here? Yeah. Okay. Somebody called us kind of worried because they saw Jason come over here and yeah. he was going in the car and... They weren't sure what was going on? No, no. everything's fine. Everything's just, fine? Yeah. Okay. They were just a little worried because they saw the car running over here and they weren't sure what was going on yeah. and all that jazz. You want to just slide it out of there? I don't want to take your wallet from you. Sorry for all this, like, It's okay. Emotion. It's okay. I'd rather come here and check and it be yeah. nothing than have something bad happening. Uh, Ezra, where do you live? Okay. There Thank you go. You. you guys are good to go. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We're good to go. Everything's good. They're okay. Yeah. Everything's fine. I'll take care of it, too. No problem. All right. Yeah, have a good day. At this time, they decided that everything was indeed fine, and they left a short time later. Jason now approached Ezra's car, and they spoke briefly. Before Ezra said that she and Alex would finish their conversation somewhere else, Ezra then drove away with Alex in the passenger seat. Three hours later, around 4.15pm, Ezra knocked on farmer Don Sipple's door. Her clothes were ripped, she had no shoes on, and she was covered in mud, blood and bruises. Ezra stated that she could not remember her name, or anything else. She instructed Don to contact a doctor. Don instead called the police. When they arrived, she told them to call Jason, and they then drove her to the hospital. She had three cuts on the palm of her hand, and the word boy was carved into her forearm. She also had signs of injury on her thighs and her jaw. Ezra was presenting as if she had been attacked. When the nurses asked Ezra about the word boy on her arm, she said that Alex Woodworth did it. However, the hospital staff could tell that the injuries were self-inflicted. The police started looking for Alex, searching his house, his place of work, and anywhere else that he could normally be found. But they could not find him. They contacted his family, but they too had not heard from Alex. Did you guys leave Alex's house shortly after the cops came and checked in on you guys? Yep, because okay. I talked to the officer and said I was feeling fine and stuff, and he said everything seemed fine. Okay, so then you left, and what vehicle did you leave in? It's my car. Okay. And then who was driving? Um, I was driving. Okay. And then Alex was in the passenger seat? Yeah. Okay. And then what happened? And then we were driving and I was talking about stuff and he seemed a little upset about some things and then after that it just kind of gets funky like in my brain. Like I just start... To, it's like there's a blank slate. What was he getting upset about? He was upset because he... He was upset because of John and stuff. Because I talked a little bit about, like, okay. you probably get questioned and stuff like that. That's what I just told him. Was like, I'm sure you might get questioned at some point during the case and things. And he seemed upset about it. But he mostly seemed upset about Jason and I because he told me, like, that if I proceeded to talk to Jason, he would be very upset. Okay. So then what happened? And then I just kind of remember just trying to explain myself and stuff, and then it just kind of gets, like, fuzzy for me. Okay. I just feel, like, all I can feel is, like, anxiety and, like, pain okay. and stuff. You get found in Menominee. Mm -hmm. How do you get to Menominee? I don't know. I just kind of felt like I woke up, and I was scared, so I was just walking down the road. Where, like, what do you remember about that? I mean... I remember being cold. 
Okay. And that my feet hurt really bad. If there is anything else that I would need to know, what else would I need to know? I mean, how would I have find Alex? I don't know. Did he talk about wanting to harm himself ever? Did he talk about wanting to harm you? Did he? He's in the past talked about harming himself. A lot. Okay. Like what does he say? He usually he would talk about how that he would get upset because I didn't like like him fully the way he liked me, and that it made him sad enough to want to hurt himself, and he actually did cut his wrist once, and it really scared me. Whilst investigating, police saw muddy footprints coming from the top of the hill to the road and came across a car stuck in the mud. The car was at some distance, so they pulled out their binoculars. Doing so, they noticed a body hanging halfway out of the back seat. They then raced towards the car and immediately recognised it as Ezra's and identified the body as Alex Woodworth. Alex had 16 injuries made by a sharp implement. Police then returned to the hospital to inform Ezra of their findings and suddenly, miraculously, she remembered everything. Alex came after me. Okay, walk me through that, please. Mm. Like, how it happened. I was in the back seat and I was looking for stuff and I was moving things out of the way, trying to find anything to get my car out of there because mm-hmm. I was already anxious as it is. And then Alex came up from behind me and then he just started grabbing me. Okay, how was he grabbing you? He grabbed me by the throat. Okay. And then he pushed me down. When you say he pushed you down, where did he push you down? In the car. Okay. And then he was on top of me and he started cutting things. And it was really scary. Okay, so he was cutting things on you. What was he cutting again? My pants. Okay, and then what happened? He cut my pants and I tried to grab it and I hurt my hand. Okay, let's see the hand, please. Okay. And then... I was moving a lot, and he cut my leg right here. Okay. And then what happened? And then after that, I started trying to wrestle him and fight him off of me. and okay. kick him do whatever I could, but I got the knife, and then I just started... How did you get the knife from him? I grabbed it. I grabbed it from him, and I pulled. What did you grab? The blade, or... I grabbed the, the blade the one time, and that hurt a lot. Okay. So I tried grabbing the base of it. Okay. And then I just let him out. Okay. So once you have the knife in your hand, what happens? I just he kept grabbing me. Okay. Where, how was he grabbing you? Grabbing me by the arm and by like just anywhere. He just kept grabbing me. Okay. So freaking out. I was just freaking out. So he's grabbing you. And your which hand do you have the knife in? This one. Okay. And how are you holding it? I was just holding it like this. Okay. So your right now you have your fist pointing towards me. Was the blade pointed up or blade pointed down? Do you remember? I think it was pointed down. Okay. So then, do you remember? Maybe. Do you remember where you ended up stabbing him? I, I don't really fully know because it was just anything and everywhere. Okay. Anything and everywhere is where you're stabbing him. So, was he on top of you? So, you have it here. Do you know if you stabbed him in the back or any place? I don't know if I had it facing up or down. Okay. But I just... Okay. Everywhere. Did all this stabbing take place in the car or outside? More of it took place outside of the car because he went on top of me again. He went on top of you again outside. So, most of the stabbing you said took place outside. It was inside the car, a lot took place, and then not that much else took place outside of the car after he tried, he was on top of me again. Okay, so it, you kind of lost me on that part, Ezra. So some of the stabbing took place in the car, mm-hmm. a lot of it took place outside. Not a lot. A lot of it took place in the car, and then outside the car, it came after me again. Okay. She claimed that she attacked Alex out of self-defense. She said that whilst they were arguing, he reached over and grabbed her forearm, causing her to panic. 
He began calling her boy and then took a knife and carved the word into her arm. He did this, she said, because he knew she struggled with her gender identity in high school. The police, however, were sceptical of her story. Alex would have had to have reached across Ezra, ignoring the arm that was already closest to him. And he would have had to have carved the word upside down. Boy was carved in such a way that only Ezra could read it the right way up, not Alex. When police pushed her on this, she admitted to carving the word into her own arm. Okay. And then the boy carved in your arm. Okay. The part that throws me off on that is... If I'm sitting here, and he's going to be carving it in, he, it's written perfect with a right-hand person like this. Mm -hmm. Okay, if he would write it in, it would have been reversed, right? Mm -hmm. How did boy get put in your arm? He didn't do that to you, did he? You, you carved boy into your own arm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. When did that happen? That happened when I was in the car. In the car with him? Or why? When, when, did when I was in the car after I woke up the second time. So after you stabbed him and you came back into it as you put it because you blacked out, that's when you carved this in? Okay. How about the cuts to your legs? When did those happen? Those happened before I stabbed. And who did those? He did those. Okay. So, <laughs> so he cut you here. And but, here. And on, he cut you on the legs, you're saying. But the boy was done by you. Why? Because I felt really bad. Because I didn't want that to happen. And I felt really bad. You didn't want what to happen, but Ezra? I didn't want any of it to happen. Okay. <laughs> so I wrote it so that I have to remember what happened and feel bad about it. <laughs> what didn't you want to happen, Ezra? I didn't want the attack to happen. I didn't want him to get hurt. I feel really bad about what happened, I just did it so that I don't ever have to, so that I don't forget. Ezra now claimed that they were both in the back seat when Alex began attacking her and attempting to non-consensually assault her. She claimed that she grabbed the knife by the blade, causing the cuts in her palm, and at this point began using the blade against him. But the cuts in her palm were not deep and didn't match up with the story. They were merely superficial. Ezra claimed that Alex was in the car when she jabbed him, but all of the forensic evidence led investigators to believe that he was attacked outside. Looking at Alex's defensive wounds, he had none. Alex was found in possession of a scarf. Police believed he used it to apply pressure to his wounds before passing out. His phone was found smashed on the road. Ezra claimed that it fell, but the evidence said that she smashed it intentionally. Nine days after the attack on April the 6th, 2018, Ezra was arrested and charged with first-degree intentional homicide. On October the 15th, 2019, 18 months after Alex passed, the trial began. Alex was manipulating Ezra into intimate acts according to Ezra's defense story. So, let me ask this. Did Alex refer to you as a boy? Yes. Do you know why he referred you to you as a boy? Did he tell you why? Yes. Can you tell us about that? Well, as our relationship progressed, um, I told him about how I identified in the past as almost strictly masculine. And he, he preferred that I presented myself in a masculine way. He often told me how confident I looked and how much he was attracted to me because he could call me a boy, his boy, and present that way. Did you present yourself as a male to Alex? Yes, I did. What about the word boy specifically? How did you feel about his use of the word boy? The word boy specifically, at first it was gender, as you can call it, but then the word became more 
possessive. I was his boy. It felt objectifying at times. And what do you mean by objectifying? I felt as if I was an object, that I was not Ezra McCandless, essentially, but I was just his boy. Ezra now once more changed her story, claiming that she need Alex, causing him to drop the knife. And she then grabbed the knife and began attacking him back. This was instead of the story she told the police, saying she grabbed the knife by the blade. Prosecution claimed that the attack was premeditated. When Ezra left Eau Claire, she took the knife from her father's house and kept it in the car until she saw Alex. The prosecution claimed that once they left Jason at Alex's house, they were driving down the road and the car then became stuck. And then when Alex exited the car to inspect the situation, Ezra attacked him from behind. Because his body was only halfway in the seat, it's believed that he either attempted to climb in to save himself, or that he got himself back in the seat and Ezra attempted to drag him out. Alex's wounds were not instantly fatal. This means that he would have survived if he had received medical attention sooner. The prosecution claimed that Ezra took Alex out of the picture because she wanted to rekindle her relationship with Jason. To do this, in Ezra's eyes, Alex needed to be gone. However, the defence claimed that Alex did not want Ezra to rekindle her relationship with Jason and that when he forced himself on her, she then attacked him in self-defence. On November the 1st, 2019, Ezra McCandless was convicted of first degree intentional homicide against Alex Woodworth after just three hours of deliberation. Ezra was sentenced to life in prison on February the 7th, 2020, with the possibility of parole after 50 years. The judge stated that he chose 50 years in the hopes that Alex's parents will not be alive to experience a heartbreak of seeing someone who took their son's life to be free again. I want to say how sorry I am that they have lost their son. But sorry doesn't cut it in my mind. That word is not enough and never will be enough for this loss. And I recognize that. I don't think I could ever find words that will be enough to express this, especially to them. The pain they feel is unimaginable. I want to express how sorry I am for this loss because it is such a great loss. I recognize and completely acknowledge this pain, and I'm so sorry. I loved Alex very much, and I also feel a great loss. And I'm so sorry. And thank you for letting me say this. Thank you. Ezra is currently being held in Wisconsin. Her mother runs an Instagram account that sells her artwork in order to fund her appeals. I feel like she's with someone against her will. Or maybe worse. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Savannah and all those affected by this dark case. Savannah Page Gold was a 21-year-old woman from Jacksonville, Florida. She had a heart of gold to match her name. She was a remarkable young woman who was known for her charm. She was kind and had a compassionate nature. She was born to Daniel and Sherry, joining brother Chris. Savannah had a special bond with her mother. They were not just mother and daughter, but also best friends. Sherry was sadly battling with cancer. 
so the doting daughter helped her to navigate the challenges of chemotherapy. This helped them to form a unique relationship built on love and support. Savannah truly was priceless to the family. She also worked hard at Bonefish Grill as a waitress. This was a job she had been in for around two years, and there she left a lasting impression on her co-workers and the customers that she served. All of this whilst making money to support the family. Her genuine and friendly personality made her a beloved figure in the restaurant. Her friends described her as someone who loved fiercely, gave generously, and someone that had a fantastic sense of humour. She was a perfectionist in her endeavours, and she always strived to give her best. It was evident that she approached life with passion and dedication. Savannah had dreams of attending the coincidentally named Savannah College of Art and Design. She even received scholarships for her talents in lacrosse and art. However, her decision not to pursue this path showed her deep-rooted commitment to her family, with her mother's health concerns leading Savannah to put her family's well-being above her own ambitions. Her presence in the lives of those around her her made her a cherished daughter, sister, and friend. Jacksonville is a vibrant city in a northeastern area of Florida. It sits along the Atlantic coastline of the United States. As the largest city by land area in the US, it has a huge mix of both natural landscapes and urban attractions. On August 2, 2017, Savannah had begun her day like any other. She prepared to go to her shift at the Bonefish Grill. This was set to begin at 5.30pm. On her way to work, she spoke with one of her good friends. During the conversation, they happily talked about the next time that they would get together. Savannah had begged her friend to hang out with her over the previous days but her friend had been sick with a cold. A cold that she jokingly said that Savannah had given to her. They continued to make future plans of spending time together, and then Savannah ended the conversation to begin her shift at the restaurant. Ten minutes later, Savannah's supervisor was expecting her to show up at any moment, ready to start work. It was a rather slow day inside the restaurant on a weekday, and she was scheduled to work after all. When Savannah never walked through the door, her supervisor grew slightly frustrated. However, they simply removed her hours from the schedule, and business continued as usual into the evening. 30 minutes after Savannah's failure to appear at work, her father received a text message coming from her phone number. The message detailed how Savannah had found a man that she had fallen in love with, and that this love was so intense that they were going to run away together. They were willing to leave both of their families and their homes behind. The message also said that Savannah would contact her parents, but only once she and her newfound love arrived at their final destination. Destination. Moments later, Savannah's brother also received a text message from his sister, one that said that she couldn't take it anymore, saying that she had to leave town. Once the initial surprise of this news wore off, Savannah's parents took a second to read over the message more carefully. After noticing multiple grammatical and spelling errors throughout the messages, Savannah's mother quickly took note of the words that were used and the structure of the message. Since they texted quite frequently throughout each day, Savannah's mother almost immediately knew that something was wrong. Whoever was sending these messages was not her daughter. Savannah's parents swiftly called her number. They were hoping that they would hear her familiar voice on the other side of the line. However, when the call was sent straight to voicemail, the anxiety they were feeling only grew. After multiple attempts to reach her, they began to think of other ways that they could make sure that Savannah was safe. Knowing that she had a shift at the Bonefish Grill, they called the number of the restaurant in order to check on her. When the supervisor who answered the phone reported that Savannah had never turned up for work, the concern in their stomachs turned into a deep-rooted fear that something was gravely wrong. They wasted no time in contacting the police. The hunt for Savannah Gold was on. 
Since Savannah's last known location was somewhere between her home and the restaurant where she worked, the first place investigators visited was the Bonefish Grill. They walked inside and asked employees about Savannah, asking whether they had seen her, whether they knew where she was, or if they had any information to help their investigation. Meanwhile, other officers were in the parking lot. They were scouring for any sign that she might have been there at some point. To their surprise, they quickly found Savannah's car in the back of the parking lot. The doors were unlocked and upon further inspection, all of her important belongings were inside. This included her ID and her purse. The driver's side tyre had been punctured. It sat flatly on the parking spot. This discovery led police to seriously question the validity of the messages that had been sent from Savannah's phone. They now firmly believed that Savannah had been kidnapped. With this information, officers obtained security camera footage from the restaurant. This footage provided a view of the parking lot, including Savannah's parking spot. The camera showed Savannah arriving to work in her car at 5.30pm. This was exactly when her shift was scheduled to begin. Savannah then got out of her car wearing her uniform. She then walked over to a silver sedan which was parked directly beside her. After talking with the occupant of the vehicle for 15 minutes through the driver's side window, Savannah walked around to the other side of the car and got into the passenger seat. As officers continued to watch the footage, they became increasingly concerned as the video showed the silver sedan beginning to shake. It showed the door opening and then forcefully being slammed back shut. Were they now witnessing Savannah's abduction? And then suddenly the vehicle was still. Investigators squinted their eyes as a driver emerged from the vehicle. They then walked over to Savannah's car and opened the driver's side door. The quality of the security video revealed no defining features. It only showed a man who was roughly six feet tall and had short brown hair. They continued to watch as a man reached his arm inside the car. He then took out Savannah's phone and then returned to his silver sedan. A moment later, the man walked back to Savannah's car a second time. There, he knelt down and punctured the driver's side tyre. At 6.04pm, the mysterious man in a silver sedan is shown leaving the parking lot. And as far as they could tell, Savannah was seemingly still inside the car. This footage was immediate confirmation that Savannah had been abducted. And now, time was of the essence to locate her. According to this footage, Savannah hadn't been missing for long, so their hopes of finding her alive were still high. Investigators immediately got to work. They spent the following two days gaining every piece of evidence that they could. Evidence obtained from Savannah's family, friends and her co-workers. By August the 4th, the Jacksonville police already had three potential suspects in Savannah Gold's disappearance. The next thing to do was cross-reference the suspects that they had gathered with the description of the silver sedan from the security footage. From running the names and dates of birth through the Department of Motor Vehicles database, they discovered that their first suspect didn't even have a license. There was no record of a vehicle being registered to him. Their second suspect was found to drive a red jeep. He too was quickly passed over as the culprit in Savannah's kidnapping. Finally, upon a search with the information of their third suspect, they found that he owned a silver Chevy Malibu. This was an exact match to the vehicle seen in the parking lot of the Bonefish Grill. Lee Rodart Jr. had been the manager and chef at the Bonefish Grill for five years. When police had questioned him after Savannah's disappearance, he had explained to officers that they had been working together for a long while, but he said that they were not friends outside of that work arrangement. They were strictly co-workers, and Lee claimed he hadn't seen Savannah since her last shift at the restaurant. However, upon questioning other employees at the grill, 
Officers quickly found out that Lee and Savannah had been having an on and off, romantically charged relationship for the past eight months. There were three reasons why Lee wouldn't have told officers about his relationship with Savannah. Number one, it was against company policy to have romantic relationships with co-workers. And number two, Lee had a girlfriend at the time. Therefore, he was hiding crucial information to the investigation. And despite these logical reasons for withholding this information, police still listed Lee as a potential suspect. This proved to be useful as his vehicle matched the one that drove away just two days before with Savannah inside. In addition to this, police also noticed that when they first questioned Lee, he had a few cuts and scrapes on his neck and arms. This was only technically circumstantial, but it still raised alarm bells in the investigators' minds. On August 5th, 2017, Lee Rodart was arrested by officers on a warrant for driving with a suspended license. This was the opportunity investigators needed to question Lee a second time about his associations with Savannah. Police began by asking Lee to explain a second time his relationship with her. It was at this point that Lee confessed to his first lie that he told to the police. He now admitted to officers that he and Savannah had formed a romantic connection, a connection that started soon after they began working together. He said they began spending time together outside of work, but they kept this relatively secret as Lee had a girlfriend at the time. Lee continued to explain that it wasn't long before Savannah began displaying problematic behaviour, behaviour that Lee didn't agree with. According to him, since he was in a relationship and they were moving so fast, he made the decision to start distancing himself from Savannah. He said he told her that they couldn't talk to each other anymore. As the questioning officer continued to question Lee, he asked a second time when the last time that he'd seen Savannah was. Lee then confessed to the second lie that he had told. He now admitted that he had talked to Savannah three days earlier on the day that she disappeared. According to him, he and Savannah had both arrived to work at the grill at the same time that day and that they had even parked next to each other. When Lee had seen Savannah, he asked to talk to her for just a second. Lee detailed how the two discussed the fact that Savannah had been telling her co-workers about their previous fling. And remember, this fling was something that was against company policy, and Lee didn't want to get fired. It was at this point that Savannah got into the car, and an argument began. According to Lee's story, Savannah was angered by this confrontation. She apparently said that she was allowed to talk about whatever she wanted with her co-workers. After a period of raised voices and swearing, Lee told officers that Savannah got out of his car and walked out of the parking lot. He said there she was picked up by a green old Ford truck. Whilst Lee had chosen to be more truthful than he was the first time round, officers knew that he was still lying. After much preparation for this very moment, officers prepared to reveal the evidence they already had. With an eerie calmness, the questioning officer revealed to Lee that they knew his story was a complete fabrication. He was lying. They explained that they had seen the security footage of Lee leaving the parking lot in his car, a car that Savannah got into but never got out of. Lee continued for a long while to deny that he took Savannah anywhere, resting on his story that she had been picked up by a green truck. However, officers would not and could not accept this story, so they continued to press Lee for the truth. They made it abundantly clear that they knew what had really happened. And eventually, after a long and gruelling interrogation, Lee Rodart finally gave in to the pressure that he faced from those questioning him. You can do this. You can do the right thing. She was hitting me. I just... She wouldn't stop and I'd squeeze back. Okay. And she was just... Was she under your arm or something, or? She started hitting me, you know, after I, you know, slashed her tire. Right. And 
we went back and forth and I just I squeezed her. You squeezed her around her neck or around her neck with your hands? She had. She had. She had her hands around mine. Okay. You had yours around hers, and y'all were just fighting back with each other. Okay. She just wanted to let go, and I didn't let go. Okay. Everything that Lee had said prior to Savannah exiting the vehicle had been true. They had gotten into an argument about Savannah telling people about their romantic ventures. However, instead of getting out of the car, Lee explained that Savannah started to physically attack him. He continued to say that he had to defend himself against Savannah's strikes. This was until he eventually had to wrap his hands around her neck. He said he squeezed until he heard a popping noise. He says he looked down and realised that he had accidentally ended Savannah's life. And that all of this was just an attempt to protect himself. Lee continued to explain that after this occurred, he left a parking lot with Savannah in the car and drove back to his house. It was here where he placed Savannah's body in his fire pit and then set it alight. He said he burned over 75% of her body before removing it. He then wrapped it in sheets and put it back in his vehicle. He then drove to a lake in the woods of a dead end street and there he dumped her body into the water. Lee remained firm on the notion that he had accidentally ended the life of Savannah Gold, that this was indeed just a case of self-defence. Officers confirmed Lee's story with further security footage, video which showed evidence of his car at the lake on the day of Savannah's disappearance. Officers travelled to the lake and made every attempt possible to gather more evidence, and hopefully to recover Savannah's body. With the assistance of a dive team, Savannah's body was recovered from the water. An autopsy was promptly performed. However, this autopsy would prove essentially nothing. The burns to her body had concealed her cause of death. The only thing they did know was that Savannah had suffered a violent homicide at the hands of Lee Rodart. When Lee was charged with second degree homicide, he pled not guilty due to the fact that he was acting in self-defence. He was subsequently remanded without bail until his trial. It took two years for Lee's case to go to trial in August of 2019. It took this long because multiple delays and postponements had taken place. When his court date finally arrived, Lee filed the Stand Your Ground petition, a law in Florida that protects those against prosecution if they were in fear for their life when they committed homicide or other severe bodily injuries. While this law in Florida more closely pertains to people who are the victims of home invasions, Lee's legal team still attempted to make it stick in this case. While the judge denied the petition and faced appeals, the trial continued to be put on hold. This meant that Savannah's family went for years without any relief from the pain that they were suffering. By February 2021, Lee and his legal team had finally realised that their appeals were getting them nowhere. Therefore, Lee changed his plea from not guilty by reason of self-defence to guilty of second-degree homicide. As part of Lee's plea deal, he would avoid the life sentence that he could have received if his case went to trial, and he would then instead receive 40 years in prison. From the years of delays in his case, the judge awarded Lee credit for the time he had served so far. This left 37 years to serve in prison, meaning that Lee could be released in 2058. 
Following the sentencing, Savannah's family spoke about the evil that Lee Rodart had committed against their daughter and sister. With Lee's back turned, he wiped away tears as Savannah's family remembered the positive light that she was in their lives, stating how Lee had taken it away so mercilessly. Savannah's father spoke about the immense, endless love that he had for his daughter, stating that the only way they could continue to go on without her is through knowing that she wouldn't want her passing to ruin their lives. And as for Savannah's mother, she struggled as her cancer had returned and twice over the course of Lee's arrest, spanning over his conviction and the rest of the legal proceedings. Because of this pain and suffering on an extreme level, the judge ordered Savannah's mother to be awarded $9,000 in restitution, and then an additional $12,000 to be awarded to a victim trust fund. Following the hearing, Savannah's brother reflected on his experience throughout the past three years. He stated that he was grateful to the professionals who so swiftly investigated and then gained justice for his sister. In addition to the restitution and the victim trust fund, the public raised an additional $6,000 in order to help the Gold family pay for Savannah's funeral expenses. This was done through a GoFundMe campaign. The Gold family will always remember Savannah as a kind-spirited, giving and artistic soul, someone who radiated kindness to everyone around her. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. And please do remember to hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon. Breakups are tough. There is no getting around that fact. Sure, sometimes you may get back together, but you have to be fully accepting that your ex may want to go their separate ways. Free to live a new life that just doesn't have you in it. But what happens when someone just can't let it go? If they can't have them, nobody can. Emma Jane Walker was born on March the 20th, 2000, to parents Jill and Mark Walker. She was a long-awaited blessing, they had always wanted a baby girl, and they always knew that they would call her Emma. Emma grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee with her little brother named Evan. She was a loving and well-loved young person. From her freshman year at Central High School, she joined the cheerleading team. Emma really took cheerleading seriously. She didn't just like doing it, it was a passion and she was great at it. She loved being part of a team and she loved football games. On the sidelines cheering for the Bobcats was where 14 year old Emma caught the eye of wide receiver number 8, Riley Gore. Riley was a junior in high school who was raised by his mother and his grandparents. Despite living in a city where Friday night football was everything, Riley really wasn't your classic jock. He was a funny and intelligent young man, someone who loved to play video games and he really did have a nerdy side. When him and Emma eventually started dating, her parents were pleased. He was someone that Mark and Jill thought was a great fit for their daughter. He was very likeable. He was well-mannered and a nice-looking young man. Soon, her social media accounts were filled with pictures of them paddleboarding together, embracing and taking silly selfies. They seemed from the outside like the perfect pair, but Emma's friends and family soon realised that Riley had a dark side. Behind closed doors, Riley wasn't as perfect as he first appeared. He got more possessive and clingy towards Emma. He wouldn't let her do certain things, not wanting Emma to hang out with anyone but him. He also would comment on what Emma wore, dictating on what she could and couldn't put on. Their two-year relationship was nothing short of tumultuous. Emma and Riley would often have dramatic fights and would frequently break up. Riley took to social media, sending Emma horrible messages on Snapchat such as I hate you, I hate everything about you and you're the biggest bitch I've ever come into contact with. You're dead to me, I'll check the obituary. 
But teenage love is fickle, and as quickly as they'd break up, they would then get back together with Riley love-bombing her. Parents Mark and Jill, however, were now less than impressed. Emma had shown them some of these vile messages. They immediately banned Riley from their home and took away Emma's cell phone. They'd seen a change in their daughter when she was with Riley, and this change wasn't a good one. In their eyes, he wasn't right for Emma. In the fall of 2016, Riley went off to Maryville College, just 17 miles south of Knoxville. This left Emma just starting her junior year in high school. Mark and Jill decided to resort to drastic measures. They grounded their daughter in an attempt to keep the couple apart. She was not allowed to leave the house unless it was for school, work or cheerleading. But to their surprise, Emma realised that she did indeed deserve much better than Riley. Around Halloween time that year, Emma decided that she had had enough of their dysfunctional relationship. She ended things with Riley once and for all. Little by little, her parents began seeing changes in their daughter. She was turning back into the old Emma now that she was out from under Riley's thumb. She would come out of her room, eat dinner and socialise with the family, something she hadn't done for a long time. However, kind of predictably, this breakup didn't sit well with Riley. He took drastic measures to get Emma's attention, and this wasn't just repeated phone calls. There was an attempt on his own life, and an occasion where, bizarrely, he faked his own kidnapping. Yes, you heard me right. Emma was at a party at a friend's house. She was loving her newfound freedom without Riley breathing down her neck. At around 11.30pm, however, Emma received a text message from an anonymous number. The message read, Go to your car with your keys. Go alone. I've got someone you love. If you don't comply, I will hurt them eventually. There were more messages and they got more and more menacing. Another one read, If you'd like to hear his crying and screams, give him a call. However, Emma wasn't dumb. She just suspected that maybe Riley had something to do with this, especially since he knew she was out at a party enjoying herself. Emma and her friends then went outside. There they saw Riley laying face down in a ditch. Now guys, I know I shouldn't laugh at this stuff, but if you actually picture this happening, it is absolutely crazy and undeniably pretty funny. Anyway, back to the case. Riley then claimed that he'd been kidnapped, but he couldn't remember anything about it because his captives had hit him on the head. But... Obviously, Emma wasn't buying any of his story. She knew that this was a cry for attention and she just walked away. She left Riley stood there looking foolish. Riley didn't take this as a sign to give up, however. The very next day, Emma saw a man dressed in black outside of her house. Terrified, she reached out to the only person she knew that she thought could help, Riley Gall. She said to him, I hate you, but I need you right now. To which he replied, I'm coming, I'm speeding, just give me a minute. When mother Jill Walker arrived home just a short time after, she saw Emma outside with Riley. And remember, Riley was banned from their house, so she was understandably furious. Jill demanded that he leave and she suggested to Emma that the man in black had probably just been Riley all along. And I for one agree with Jill. Afterwards, Emma texted her friends. She said, I'm home alone and somebody in black walked down my street and came to my door and rang the doorbell over and over again. I thought I was going to die. Little did Emma know of the foreshadowing that this message held. The following day, November the 20th, Emma went to her Sunday shift at a supermarket in town. Her parents followed her to work and back to ensure that she was safe. They did this because Riley had a history of waiting around for her in the parking lot. Apparently, he would just wait outside for hours. But on this occasion, he didn't. And later that night, things seemed to go back to normal at the Walker household. Emma texted her friend about a homework assignment. 
Then she went to bed a little after midnight. Sadly, this was the last time that her parents would ever see her alive. At 6am on Monday, November the 21st, Jill went into Emma's room to wake her up for school. Emma was unresponsive. As she got closer, this mother realised her beautiful daughter wasn't just sleeping late. In fact, she wasn't sleeping at all. Emma Walker was unresponsive and no longer breathing. I just tried to wake up my daughter for school and she has no pulse. That she's non-responsive. Yeah, her tongue's hanging out of her mouth. Stay on, the, stay on the line. I'm transferring you to rural metro. Emma's light had been snuffed out by a projectile from a firearm to the head. One single bullet had hit her behind her left ear, and a second bullet was lodged into her pillow. In total, two bullets had been fired into her bedroom from outside the family's single-story home. Further investigation revealed two shell casings a yard outside. An officer on a case, Lieutenant Alan Merritt, started interviewing friends and family members and noted that the same name was coming up over and over again. This name, obviously, Riley Gall. Meanwhile, Riley was busy posting on Facebook and Twitter about Emma's passing. Rest easy now, sweetheart, he wrote in one tweet, and I love you forever and always in another. Despite Riley's performative posts, investigators quickly brought him in for questioning. Detective James Hurst said, When I first met him, I thought he might have been a grieving boyfriend. But when we got into the interview room and sat down, I felt like there was a dark side. He didn't have a whole lot of passion or concern. Before we get started, uh, I understand you're not under arrest right now. You came down on your free and with your granddad and your mom. But because you're in a secure area, I have to read you your rights, okay? Uh, because basically if you're in a position that you can't get up and leave and get out on your own, they technically look at that in court as being in custody. But I understand you're not in custody. I've not put handcuffs on you. I've not told you you've been charged with anything really. Like it's just a film matter. While we're waiting on him, tell me a little bit about yourself. I know obviously you played uh, football at Maryville College. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you played football in high school? Yes. What position? Wide receiver, cornerback, punter, turner, kick returner, punter. You must be pretty good. Yeah. And she was, she was kind of acting frantic over the phone. And she said that someone was trying to get into her house. Somebody was dressed in all black. They had a face mask on. She said that she saw him. She said she thought they were just taking a walk in the neighborhood. And then when she passed them to pull into her driveway, they put on a pair of glasses. And they started, like, she said they kind of, like, sped up. So she went into the garage and shut the garage. And that's when I dropped all the stuff I was in at my stepdad's house and drove all the way to her neighborhood. Do you have, did you say she texted you that information? She, or just, she texted me, like, she was asking if it was me at first. And I told her, no, what's going on? And that's when she FaceTime called me. She was crying and freaking out. So I said, okay, give me a minute. I'll come down there and check it out. I, uh, I went to her backyard, made sure, you know, nobody was back there, checked under the porch and everything. Mm -hmm. um, looked up and down the street. 4.30, I fell asleep. Uh, fell asleep around then. And that's when I woke up to people calling me about what had happened. Well, first he, he had texted me, and he was like, hey, man, I'm sorry about what happened. So I was like, what are you talking about? And he called me after that, and he said, did you not hear what happened? I said, no, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, they found Emma dead in her bed this morning, or unresponsive is what he told me. And that's when I started uh, freaking out, having a breakdown. So my parents, or my mom and my grandmother, were coming out to campus to get me. They probably got there around 9 ish. 30, somewhere around there. Tell me, tell me what you know about Emma's uh, passing. I know there's been all kinds of rumors and speculation. What have you heard? I've tried to, but in tune all of it out because I've heard so many different things. I've heard she just passed in her sleep. I heard she tried to commit. I heard a stray bullet came to the wall, but that made no sense to me because it's her room, if a stray bullet hit the wall, it's from, it would have to be from the backyard, because that's where her window is. 
Jamestown. So, yeah, I don't know. That one didn't make sense to me, but those are the main three. Riley told the police that he'd been trying to speak with Emma that weekend, but allegedly she refused to engage with him until he helped her write a paper. He went on to claim that on Sunday night, he used one of his friend's phones on campus to call her. He said that this conversation didn't go very well. Supposedly, Emma blocked the number after she was abusive towards Riley. Afterwards, Riley told detectives he went over to his grandparents' house, but he said it was only a brief visit and then he drove back to his college. Once he was there, he said he cried in his car for two or three hours before going to bed. Riley's interview was disconnected. It seemed rehearsed and deliberate, but although the interview was indeed suspicious, police had no solid evidence that they could use to arrest Riley. That was until two of Riley's close friends gave detectives the break that they needed. Riley's college friends Alec McCarthy and Nora Walton quickly told investigators that Riley had displayed some concerning actions ever since Emma had broken up with him. They told them all about the fake kidnapping incident and the harassment, but they also had information that proved to be paramount to the case. On Saturday, November the 19th, the very day after Riley's fake kidnapping, he told Alex that he stole his grandfather's gun, a 9mm Glock pistol, in order to protect himself. However, his grandfather stored the gun in his car and actually reported this gun missing. Riley later asked Noah how to get fingerprints off of a gun, and he then eventually asked both of these friends to help him dispose of the weapon. Riley swore to his friends that he had not killed Emma, but he wanted to toss the gun into the Tennessee River because he was worried the police would unfairly connect him to the crime if they ever learned that he had it. When questioned about the gun, Riley claimed that he didn't know where it was. He denied showing it to Alex, and he also denied asking Noah about removing the fingerprints. The evidence was damning, but detectives wanted a smoking gun, so to speak. Alex and Noah agreed to team up with investigators to reveal the truth. And like something from a movie, they were fitted with cameras and microphones. And then they participated in a sting operation. During this operation, they accompanied Riley to dump the gun that he'd used to kill Emma. What you are about to see is really some of the most crazy footage I've ever seen. Sorry about him, my dog. I can't, I really, I want to be so upset, I can't because I'm putting away from murder that I did. Never in my life would I kill someone that I love that much. Love you, bro. It sucks you gotta deal with all this. Trusting you guys, like, with my life, because, I mean, this is 70 years in jail if I get convicted of something I didn't do. So why can't you just give me a gun? Just, it just needs to be gone. For whatever reason, just it just needs to be I honest. You guys don't have to come with me if you don't want to. I mean, I got your back, man. If it's in the Tennessee River, they will never find it. With the help of Riley's friends, police were able to intervene. They found Riley not only in possession of the murder weapon, but also the black clothing that the man was wearing outside of Emma's house. Riley was caught red-handed. He was arrested and charged with ending the life of his girlfriend, Emma Walker. Riley went on trial in May of 2018. His defence attorney, Wesley Stone, argued in court that he never meant to kill Emma, but he had fired the gun to try to scare her and get her attention. Stone also stated that Riley denied being the mysterious man dressed in black. He said in court, He never intended to cause her harm, never intended to cause her death. After just five hours of deliberation, jurors found Riley guilty of first-degree homicide as well as stalking, theft, reckless endangerment, and being in possession of a firearm during a dangerous felony. In the state of Tennessee, a first-degree murder conviction carries an automatic life sentence. However, Riley's sentence allows a possibility of parole after 51 years. The sentence imposed for the additional convictions adds up to a little more than a decade. However, these sentences will run at the same time as the life sentence. Essentially, they are purely symbolic. At his sentencing hearing, Riley told Emma's family that he wanted to scare her 
I never meant to take Emma's life. Words that obviously offered no comfort to those that loved Emma so dearly. Montgomery County 911, where's your emergency? I just stabbed myself and I killed my two children. You stabbed yourself and killed your two children? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what's your name? Brandy Worley. Jason Worley married the love of his life, Brandy, in 2009. He was a software engineer and a self-proclaimed geek. Brandy was a free spirit and a great mom to their two kids, seven-year-old Tyler and three-year-old Charlie. The family lived in Darlington, Indiana, and were as happy as any family could be. Or at least that's what it looked like from the outside. Behind closed doors, it wasn't all happy families. In 2015, things had started to grow tense. Jason had taken on more responsibility at work and was now working 60 hours per week. He was stressed, but he couldn't help but notice that Brandy was withdrawn. The two of them were now bickering more than ever. Jason wondered whether the two of them were growing apart or whether there was more to it. In May, he noticed that she had added a password to her phone. When he confronted her about it, she told him she was planning his Father's Day present and she simply didn't want to ruin the surprise. She couldn't keep a secret from him and less than a week later, she told him that she was having their neighbor, a contractor, build a home office for Jason as a present. So maybe he was just overthinking. However, as nice as the surprise seemed, Brandy's behavior was becoming more and more suspicious. She'd put her phone away suddenly if he came into the room. She was always texting and smiling at her phone. Jason was growing more anxious and he knew something wasn't right. He checked her phone on one occasion when she'd left it unlocked. And he found out that the person she was texting was indeed their neighbor, the contractor. However, the messages were not about the home office she was planning to build for Jason. As time went by, the neighbor would spend more and more time at the couple's home, but his office didn't seem to be moving forward at all. Jason needed to know that he wasn't just being paranoid, so he installed an anti-theft app on Brandy's phone, telling her he was installing an antivirus. This way, he could manually find her phone whenever he needed to from his own device. He also set a backup of her messages to his computer. He watched his wife text as she tried to meet up with a neighbor, unsuccessfully. He also watched as Brandy made more plans to go to a show with a neighbor's girlfriend, leaving the men alone together to watch the children. That evening, he watched as she texted the neighbor while he was sat across the room from him. The nature of the messages was now intimately charged, and they were trying to arrange a time and place to meet. Then they did something that broke Jason's heart completely. They mentioned love. This wasn't just a physical thing. They were talking about love. Jason decided to confront them all when the women returned from the show. Brandy denied everything while the neighbor's girlfriend was in shock. Jason told Brandy that he'd had enough. He wanted out of their marriage. Brandy saw her whole life crumbling and seeing that denying everything wasn't working, she adopted a more defensive approach. She blamed her husband for working too many hours and that she felt lonely. So she turned to the neighbor for company. She also told Jason that if they got a divorce, she'd make sure that he'd never get to see his children again, saying she would somehow prove that he was an unfit parent. He was terrified of losing his kids. After many fights, they decided on a temporary separation. This was in order to give themselves the time and space to think about what their next step may be. Jason would stay in their home and Brandy would take the children and stay at her mother's house. But this separation only made things worse. Brandy told the children that daddy was mad at her and that was the reason why they had to move out. Jason went to his in-law's house to see his kids, only to find them crying and confused as to why their daddy didn't want to live with them anymore. So, in order to keep his children with him, Jason decided to stay with Brandy. 
burying the affair somewhere deep in his mind and simply trying not to think about it. His wife had won and she knew it. She made him apologise to their neighbour and he did as he was told for the sake of his children. But although Brandy had sworn it was all over, Jason couldn't forget the affair and lived in constant fear of making her unhappy. But this fear became real when he caught Brandy texting the neighbour again just months later. On Friday the 28th of October 2016, Jason took to the online forum Reddit to ask for advice. He posted as Jason in hell sharing his story. He said, I still think about it constantly. This is going to sound stupid, but I feel like I have a part of my brain that I can't shut off that's always thinking. Ever since this incident, the only thing it thinks about is her and him, and if I did the right thing. Jason mentions how his job performance has been severely affected by this. He can't sleep and he's more stressed than ever. He says he's afraid that begging her to stay with him for the kids has been a massive mistake. But if he were to ask for a divorce after taking her back, it would only make her more vindictive and use her children against him once more. Jason could sense that his wife would do anything to prevent the divorce from being real. The general advice from Reddit was to find a good lawyer and get out of that marriage as soon as possible. And in fact, her infidelity would help him keep custody of the children and that she couldn't stop him from seeing them. Users on Reddit were supportive, more supportive than he could have expected. Some of them said, I cannot believe you stayed with her. I cannot believe you apologised to the neighbour. Staying in a marriage for the sake of the kids never works out. She is poison in your life. Get rid of it. While some of the comments were harsh, they gave him the courage he needed to go on with the divorce. On November the 1st, Jason posted an update telling everyone he was meeting with an attorney the following week. He was getting himself and his kids out of that relationship. That was the last thing that Jason in hell would post on that thread. On November the 15th, Jason told Brandy that he wanted a divorce and that he was going to fight for the children. This completely blindsided Brandy. She just didn't see it coming. She had thought that her husband was under the thumb, but after years of walking on eggshells around her, he finally stood up to her. And after her ongoing affair, she began to realise that he had a good chance of winning custody of the children. It wasn't a nice conversation for Jason, but he'd done it. He'd taken control and he was putting himself and the kids first. The next day, he was determined to put on a united front for Charlie and Tyler. That evening, it was Charlie's dance recital and the family attended together. After they came home, while Jason was fixing dinner for the children, Brandy headed to Walmart to pick up some materials for one of Tyler's school projects. After dinner, the children were put to bed in their rooms, and given the impending divorce, Jason was sleeping in the basement on an air mattress while Brandy took the bedroom. It wasn't ideal, but at least Jason was still with his kids, and to him, that was all that mattered. The Worley family went to sleep, and the house fell silent. At 4am, Jason awoke to blood-curdling screams. Terror flooded through his body as he flew up the basement stairs, and there he found his mother-in-law wailing. Why would she even be there? Time slowed to a halt at that moment for Jason. He pieced together what had just happened. He found his mother-in-law in the kitchen. She was crying and screaming that the children were dead. In the living room on the couch, Jason found his wife covered in blood. She looked at him and told him, Now you can't take the kids from me. He fell to the ground in a heap. Emergency services arrived at 4.30am, but there was nothing they could do to save Tyler and Charlie. Their own mother had ended both of their lives. Brandy Worley was taken to hospital and treated for self-inflicted wounds, from which she recovered quickly. 
Once out of the hospital, she was arrested and charged with two counts of felony murder. Our detectives are still in the process of interviewing witnesses in this case, and a detective will be attempting to interview Brandy Worley as soon as her medical condition allows. I can't imagine the pain and the grief that these families are experiencing this morning. Please keep these families in your thoughts and prayers. This is extremely unusual. We, we are not used to dealing with things like this. I also had a chance to meet with a woman who was around the block from Brandy Worley, and she wanted to point out that she helped the children just a couple of days ago make a birthday card for their mom. And here's a copy of that card. I hope you can see it. It says, Happy Birthday, Mommy, from Tyler and Charlie. And inside is this inscription. You're so special, Mommy. If ever any mommy was loved a whole bunch, you must know who it is. Just bet you do. And if ever any wish was filled with hugs and kisses, this is. And mommy, you can bet they're all for you. Happy birthday, Tyler and Charlie. It was always a really good family. I mean, you couldn't ask for better people. Our son's best friend, and uh, she watched our children, and. We, we always got along. I don't see this side of Brandy. She was a, a great person. Investigators desperately tried to piece together the early hours of the morning to find answers. And Brandy gave them all the answers that they needed. Sometime in the middle of the night, Brandy woke up her son. She told him they were having a sleepover in Charlie's room and led him to his sister's bedroom. On the way, she had also grabbed the sharp implement that she'd bought from Walmart earlier that evening. She wasn't there for school supplies. She was there purchasing a murder weapon. Charlie was fast asleep in her bed and when Tyler got into the room, his mother stabbed him in the neck multiple times. As she was doing that, Charlie woke up and asked her what was happening. It was dark and she couldn't see very well. Brandy told her to go back to sleep. But just a few moments later, she did the same to her. While her two children bled out in front of her, Brandy attempted to take her life with the same sharp implement. Badly injured and heavily affected by a large dose of Benadryl that she had allegedly taken, Brandy then called her mother and told her what she'd done. Her mother panicked and told her she would be there as soon as she could. While she waited, a hauntingly emotionless Brandy called 911. This is that call. Montgomery County 911, where's your emergency? Darlington. Hey, what's going on there? I just stabbed myself and I killed my two children. You stabbed yourself and killed your two children? Mm-hmm. Okay, and what's your name? Brandy Worley. Brandy what? Worley. Okay. How do you spell your last name? W-O-R-L-E-Y. And where are, they, where are the children at? In my daughter's room, on the in, floor. In your daughter's room on the floor? Okay. What's uh, what's your phone number, Brandy? And, and what caused you to do this today? My husband wanted a divorce and wanted to take my kid. I won't want him to my kid. Okay, and how old are your children? Seven and three. Ten and three? Seven. Seven and three? Mm-hmm. Okay. And where did you stab yourself at? In the neck. Okay. Are you bleeding? Yeah, there's blood everywhere. Okay. And where are you at? In my living room. You're in your living room? Mm-hmm. Okay. And... <laughs> Are you, are you armed now with the knife still? No, it's in my children's room. Hello? Yeah. Okay, where's your husband at? Downstairs somewhere. Okay, what's his condition? I don't know, I haven't talked to him. And when you say downstairs, is he in a basement or? Yeah. Okay, what's his name? Jason. Is what? Jason. Nathan? Uh, Jason. Jason? Jason Morley? 
Yeah. Okay. And do you have any other weapons with you? Yeah, no. No? Okay. And are you, what are you feeling right now? I mean, are you, are you, are you tired? Are you, where? Yeah, I took, I took a lot of Benadryl. You took a lot of Benadryl? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And is there anyone else in the residence besides your children and you and your husband? Um, I called my mom. You called your mom? What did she say? I hang up and call 911 and take me here in a second. Jason, who had finally decided to free himself from the marriage for a better life with his kids, was now living his very worst nightmare. Earlier in the evening, Brandy had told him to sleep on the couch. If he had slept on the couch instead of in the basement, would he have heard their last moments? Would he have been able to save them? Or would he have perished with them? I'm sure these questions will haunt him for the rest of his life. Brandy initially pleaded not guilty, planning to claim she was legally insane. However, no one was buying it. She eventually changed her plea to guilty. In March 2018, she was sentenced to 120 years for the murder of her own two children. During the sentencing hearing, the judge said, Sometimes there's no explanation. Darkness is in this world and it penetrates our minds and our hearts. As of today, Brandy is locked up at the Indiana Women's Prison in Indianapolis. She will remain there until her final days. In a final Reddit update, Jason touched on the sentencing under a different username. He said that no sentence, however tough, would bring his children back, and a death sentence would have given her what she wanted and failed to do to herself. He said he doubted a life sentence would have changed her mind. She had always been proud of living with no regrets. In his post, he updated everyone on how he was feeling. His life had been a constant struggle since he had lost his children. He turned to alcohol and even contemplated ending his own time on this planet over the tragedy. With the help of his family and friends, he's coping and moving forward every day. He now considers himself to be doing well. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Let me know down in the comments. Be careful out there and I'll see you soon.